Yesterday it was Brittany that played the backdrop to a dramatic day where the Irishman Dan Martin collected stage honours. Today it is the longest stage of the race as the journey east gets underway in earnest. 231 kilometres and a day for the sprinters. Matthew Keenan with you, joined by Robbie McEwen. As you can see from the stage map, it is a journey directly across to the east with the destination being Chartres. It is a town that has hosted numerous stage finishes in the past of the Tour de France. 231 kilometres. There's a Category 4 climb at the midway point on the stage. The battle for green jersey honours, that comes a little bit later on. And then the time bonus just inside the last 20 kilometres to go. Robbie, it will be a long journey for them to make it through to the finish line, but they start in this gorgeous town with one of the most famous old chateaus here in France, one of the most imposing. The chateau actually covers some two hectares. This is enormous and a great attraction for so many tourists. Well, Fougere, it is a beautiful town, but what concerns the riders the most is it's such a long way from Chateau. 231 kilometres, the longest stage of this year's Tour de France, and on top of that, they first have 8.6 kilometres of neutralised route, which doesn't count to the race kilometres. They'll be riding 240 kilometres today, but certainly a beautiful place to start on the partially ruined but a much intact Chateau de Fougere. That for Lotto and El Jumbo today, it's not Robert Hessing. They've put Antoine Tollhook up the front because he's so much smaller than the others. So he'll provide very little shelter particularly for Tim de Klerk. Look at the size difference between the two of them. And you can see Yellow Benedert, who's sitting behind Antoine Tolhook, he's down on the drops, tucking his head in, in a desperate effort to stay out of the wind. Talking of the wind, look where the riders are positioned on the road, over in the right-hand edge. So that means that wind is just starting to hit them from right to left, forcing them over to the right-hand side. So as the day goes on, if that wind increases and this course really opens up, and on that and that's topic, why the entire Movistar team today at the front, they won't get caught out twice. Astana as well. They didn't get caught out yesterday. Yeah, they look. had a problem there with Fogelsang with a crash. Yeah. And that was only in the final 25 kilometres. They weren't caught out in the crosswind, but they're being very attentive at the moment as well. The moment to really worry is if the whole quick step team goes up to chase, in inverted commas, chase the breakaway, because then you can expect anything. What you can really expect is a crosswind attack like yesterday. If they do happen to move up to the numbers, you'll see quite a panic in the bunch to get up there and be very close. Because they really split the peloton to pieces yesterday with that team attack. The wind seemed to be quite a bit stronger than it is today but you can't get complacent well quick step the team manager Patrick Lefebvre he spoke yesterday this these are the arms of Thomas Marzinski recognize those tattoos anywhere Polish rider who last year won two stages in the Volta de Spagna he loves Spain he lives in Granada and he's been there for more than 10 years and he's now speaking to the current Spanish national road champion Gorka Izaguirre on the topic of the wind Yesterday after the stage, the quick-step team manager, Patrick Lefebvre, as we look at one of the riders from that team, Julian Alaphilippe, said they were out there trying to split the race to pieces because they wanted the yellow jersey. And they have not given up hope of getting yellow. Julian Alaphilippe is their best chance. He's in fourth position at six seconds behind in the overall standings. Then Philip Gilbert is in fifth place at 12 seconds. Gilbert could get it on Sunday to Roubaix. Gilbert really made his name as a rider for the Ardennes Classics, winner of Flesh Wallonne, Liège, Baston Liège, Amstel Gold. Since has also won the Tour of Flanders, and he knows his way across cobbles. And he's developed into a rider who's become not as nippy in the hills, but he's become overall stronger. And he's really good across the cobbles. So the cobbles of Roubaix, they'll suit him. He won't be out of his element. He'll be fine. And he has ridden Paris Roubaix on a number of occasions. And he'll believe he can leave Greg Van Avermaet behind. 
and make it into any front group and take that yellow jersey. I told you it was harvest time. Farmer Robbie. Bit of cloud cover for the first time in this year's tour. And that will be welcome to most of the riders in the race because given the region that we're in, it's been a hot start to the tour. Most days, the temperature have been the high 20s and just flirting with the low 30s. To the last 22 degrees at the finish at the moment. Supposed to get to about 23 maximum. That wind strength of around 20 kilometres an hour at its strongest. Forecast to be cloudy, but not rain. Which is perfect. And now Johan Afredo, our sole leader from Monte Group Group. He knows the chase is on. No longer riding on the brake levers. He's down into the drops, maximizing his aerodynamics. And it's a long, long way to go. But he's trying to defend at least some of that eight minute and two second advantage that he's got. down to just a fraction over a one minute lead there are the points on offer 20 for the win 17 then 15 eventually it works its way down to one point for the 15th rider across the line Mitchelton Scott also getting themselves to the front now that's Michael Hepburn who's leading the team on the right side of the picture on the opposite side of the road in the blue Morvistar for Nara Quintana, Alejandro Valverde and Mika Landa. Up the middle, this is Rory Sutherland in the red helmet and the blue shoulders from UAE Team Emirates for Dan Martin. Also for Alexander Kristoff, who's popped himself on the wheel of Peter Sagan in green right in the centre of the picture. Peter Sagan currently leads the points classification by 43 points ahead of Fernando Gaviria. Out the back of the race. The South African national champion. You can just see the Mitchelton Scott poking into the picture. That's Daryl Impey. We heard from his sports director, Matt White, that Daryl will have the green light to have a dash for the sprint himself. He wants these 20 points, Pichon. He will get them. That's one kilometre. Still is holding a gap of a minute and seven seconds. at that green triangle flag he's enjoying a little bit of a tailwind just at the moment maybe that's just the vehicles going through underneath make it go that direction a bit of protection behind the trees from any crosswind at least and you can see that intermediate sprint in the distance dead straight road looks back to check on the whereabouts of the peloton at the moment 111 things a little bit calmer in the peloton and the sprinters would like to make it a short, easy sprint. We've seen this over the last couple of days, really not wanting to expend energy when they want to line themselves up for a possible stage victory. Get the points, mark each other, make sure there's no too great a loss at this intermediate sprint. Well, they haven't closed down on him at all. In fact, with the effort that has been applied by Laurent Pichon, he's taken back an extra couple of seconds. Not a lot, though. He'll lose those probably maybe 15 of those or so when we do see the sprint for second place at this intermediate sprint point. Souvenir for the fans on the left, threw away the bidon and you saw them immediately scramble. It's like watching a seagull go after a chip. A souvenir from a rider of the Tour de France as Pichon comes up towards the line. He'll take the maximum 20 points on offer. The rider from Fortuneo Samsic in the break yesterday, trying his hand again today. And he goes through first in Berdui. And now we await the sprint to come for the minor placings as Fernando Gaviria tries to narrow the lead of Peter Sagan. A little look over the shoulder from Pichon. He knows he cannot afford to relax at all. All that advantage will be wiped out. This is Postelberger now who's on the front of the peloton for Bora Hansgrohe. And they're inside the last 500 metres. It's not super quick at this point. 
Cavendish was showing himself towards the front, but I don't expect a full-blooded sprint from Cavendish, in fact, from any of the sprinters. It is quick, though, now as Bora Hans grow up. They've got the green jersey sitting behind the wheel of Fernando Gaviria. It's now Daniel Os. Ricesi starts in blue. Gaviria waits. Gaviria looking for maximum points on offer for second place. He collects them. 17 points for Gaviria. And Alexander Kristoff again in the white colours, keeping himself in the frame just in case the two leaders in this competition end up crashing out of the race. Well, Matt, just watching how this goes down, you saw two riders from Bora Hansgrohe doing the bulk of the lead out. Max Ricciesi had to do about 75 metres. He had to get out of the way to let Fernando Gaviria go through. So minimal effort, not only from Gaviria for maximum points, but also for Max Ricciesi. I think Bora Hansgrohe would have been better to just get out of the way at least let Ricciese burn his legs a little bit. Try and do a little something to him to take the edge off for the final sprint. They're leading them out to take points on Peter Sagan because he's always just going to stay in the wheel of Gavidia. So at least make them do the work. Might only affect them a tiny bit for the finish. But anything would be better than nothing. And what that does for the race for the green jersey is it narrows the advantage of Peter Sagan to 41 points 50 points for the stage win and as we saw on stage two where Gaviria crashed Peter Sagan on that day had a 52 point turnaround he went from 26 behind to 26 in front two days later on stage four Gaviria was first Sagan was second he would have thought well not much damage done on the day it was a 22 point swing back to Gaviria because he beat him at the intermediate sprint and the difference between first and second at the finish of a flat stage, the difference is 20 points. 50 for first, 30 for second. Yesterday, Peter Sagan was eighth on the stage on Mou de Bretagne. 10 points. It has been those sorts of days though where Sagan has dominated the green jersey when he's won it five times. Today is his 91st day in the green jersey at the Tour de France. Well, incredible stats across the board for Peter Sagan. Let's have a look at the speeds at the moment. Just around 60 kilometres an hour. Slight drag up. And you see the speed doesn't change from the lead out to the sprint itself. In fact, it got three kilometres an hour slower in the sprint compared to the lead out that Bora Hansgrohe did. And there's the results. Pichon with 20 points. And Gaviria, Sagan, Christoph, and further down, none of those riders are bothered about points. Richie Port, crossing 12th, just following the wheels of his teammates, just at the front of the peloton as they all just roll through. He stands nice and calm before the start of the stage, Dylan Grunewagen, but the tension would be starting to build for him now. It would be now, but uh, at the start of the stage, I often hear the same sort of thing from all the sprinters. Definitely non-committal on tactic. Not many of them too forthcoming with putting up a call of where they think they might finish or how confident they are of winning. In fact, the one that I've heard speak with the... Sound like he's got the most fight in his voice is Andre Greipel. Yeah, his teammates on the front, they've just reeled Laurent Pichon back in. So we move into the next phase of the stage. Pichon is caught, the race is all together, and it's the teams of the sprinters who are doing the business. Sean is caught, everything back together. Six kilometres to go to the bonus sprint for three, two and one seconds. It's Marc Soler delivers bidons. There is Marcel Kittel's numbers on the final 500 metres of the first stage. Top speed of, you can round that up to 65 kilometres per hour. And 61.6 is average speed over those 500 metres. Timing is going to be all important today for Marcel Kittel. You've spoken about him getting his positioning wrong on every sprint so far. 
So over that final 500 metres of stage one, both the top speed, which was 3k an hour quicker than Gavidia, the average speed is also faster than Gavidia's average speed over the final 500. So it comes down to positioning. That just shows you how essential it is. You can be the fastest, but you've got to be in the right spot at the right time. Sylvain Chabonel through. He's got Thomas Boudard just behind him, the sprinter from Direct Energy. They've saved themselves. They haven't been active in any of the breakaways today, Direct Energy, conceding that this was never going to be a day for the move to six seed. Daryl Limpy, Robbie, South African national champion, languishing down the back. We heard earlier in the interview with his team director, Matthew White, that he's got carte blanche. He's got a free reign to do what he wants today, to have a sprint. But at the moment, he's hanging down the back. That would suggest that Adam Yates is back here somewhere too. He tends to like to ride further down towards the back. This is about the part of the race where it's time to move up. Maybe Darrell Impey just waiting for a more open stretch of road to get himself further back up the front because it's intensifying here at the front, as you desire, on the right-hand side of the road. Lotto Sudal led by Thomas De Kent on the left. And this is the part of the race we heard about, very open through the final 50 kilometres. All the wheat fields, almost as far as the eye can see. Not a lot of protection on the side of the road in terms of forest. And there you see it. So when the wind is up and coming from the left, a lot of open sections. And that's why you see the bunch start to get a little bit nervous. I've got to say here at the finish, there's not much wind anymore. It actually has really dropped off over the last hour. And I can assure you that Robbie spends most of the last hour or so of each stage when it's a day for the sprinters with his neck go-go gadget style, looking for flags and leaves for wind direction because that is crucial to positioning in a sprint. Those open fields, they're providing the opportunity, but the power of the wind has dropped. So there's no incentive really for a team to take complete control of it because you know, that crosswind to really give them an advantage by riding a tight formation at the front of the peloton. Well. Not enough wind to split it. And that bonus sprint coming up in just a kilometre now. Bonus sprint at 31 kilometres to go. So the sign on the road and the ticker on the screen not quite agreeing. Got another update for you from New Zealand with Greg Henderson, who's just sent through the message as the former lead out man for Andre Greipel. Andre only puts the team on the front if he believes. He's put the team on the front pretty early today. Bit of movement from BMC. Greg Van Avermaet wants bonus seconds. He does. He's to in get third a bit wheel. Of a buffer. No Geraint Thomas, no Gilbert, no Alaphilippe. So, Greg Van Avermaet just trying to put himself out of reach if the others take bonus seconds in stages to come, particularly on Sunday. This is Stefan Kuhn now who's on the front and Van Avermaet collects a three second time bonus. No challenge from Marcus Burkhardt behind him. So he now moves from a lead of three seconds out to six seconds ahead of Geraint Thomas, which in terms of the riders from Quickstep who are his challenges there, it now moves Julian Alaphilippe to nine seconds and Philip Gilbert out to 15 seconds behind. Smart little move by Greg Van Avermaet. You see Burkhardt at the front of the bunch, giving the signal, all right, just spread across the road, close things down. Let's not get a counter attack. Someone getting excited, give us something else to chase. Block it down, let's get back in that formation we had. And we'll just keep everything together, nice and calm, until we start really fighting for position, leading into Chartres, where we look destined to get a bunch sprint. Richie Port now at the front of the peloton. Pretty happy with the situation. Every flat stage with potential wind that Richie Port can tick off, that makes him happy. The figure of Imanelli Verti in the blue colours from Movistar. Valverde is there. Where's Quintana? A little bit further back, sitting in around about 20th position. 
Team Sky off to the right hand side lining up behind the yellow jersey of Greg Van Abermaer and Van Abermaer has got himself on the wheel of Cavendish. The rest of the Dimension Data team have all got themselves around. It was only two, Cavendish and one other got up there. They've joined by the rest of the team. Renshaw in front of Cav, Greipel, he is on the back of his Lotto Sudal team. Groupama FDJ, they believe in the chances of Ardo, Arnold Demar and there he is in fourth wheel. Benati on the right with Quintana. Keeping him well protected. Bosenhagen is the first rider in green, followed by Vermont, then Reinhard Jensi van Rensburg, and it is Renshaw to do the job for Cavendish. This is where it's really important to establish yourself at the front. You saw the road narrows into this roundabout. They swing left, single file. Some riders have to hit the brakes. All through this final part of the race in the last 10 kilometres, the last thing you want is to have to brake, re-accelerate. It's all just those little bits of energy after such a long day on the bike. You can't afford to lose and have to re-accelerate. Left-hand side of the peloton, the blue colours, quick step floors, looking around his Alaphilippe to see where Fernando Gaviria is sitting. And he's not too far behind. Everybody breathe in. There's a little bit of a squeeze. The yellow jersey, Van Avermaet, is all on his own. Lotto at the front with three riders, but not the whole team. A couple of them have been separated from their teammates. They're going to have to work very hard to get back up there and do some meaningful work for Andre Greipel. The other BMC riders, they're making sure that Richie Port is well protected and they figure Van Avema, he can take care of himself and they'd be right. For Lotto Sudal, the men that Greipel will rely on coming into the sprint, Jens Kirkelieder and Jasper de Burst, they're the two other fastest men in the team that can provide what he needs, that build in speed, ready for him to catapult, see if he can get his victory in this year's Tour de France. Team Sky drilling it down the left-hand side of the road, desperate to get inside that three-kilometre marker to stay safe, to ensure that their leaders, Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome, don't lose any time. And it's Luke Rowe who is getting it done. Well, this turn by Team Sky on the right of picture, that is dragging a whole lot of other teams past the lead-out train of Lotto Sudal. They're the victims of Sky, just wanting to ride position. Kirk Alleda, he was on the left of screen, trying to get Andre Greipel back on terms. Dimension Data have got them pinned in somewhat. Marcel Seberg, the tall figure in red in the middle, and Greipel, he's the third man in red, right in the centre. Blue in the middle, that is Daniela Bonatti, protecting Nardo Quintana. You just saw the hand from Alexander Christoph von White onto the back of Peter Sagan in green. Well, I'm not sure if he's apologising or trying to steer him through a gap that he could follow, but Sagan is not behind his team. Count the Bora Hansgrohe riders. One, two, three, four. Peter Sagan is back in about 25th position. Centre of the picture, the green jersey over the zebra pad just now. So he's got some work to do, but we know he can slide through the peloton almost effortlessly. I think he's looking for Fernando Gaviria, who he's now shoulder to shoulder with. So he knows who he needs to follow. The rest of his teammates, they'll look around and try and find him, but they know he always turns up. Postelberger on the front in the white colours, the Austrian champion. Reinhard Jensi van Rensburg doing an outstanding job for Dimension Data. So far, good. So far, so good for Dimension Data for Mark Cavendish. He's fourth of those white jerseys with the green helmets. Through the middle for Dylan Grunewigen now. That's Lotto NL Yumbo. This is the first time we've seen them make their mark. Marcel Kittel, and look, he looks struggling. He's on the wheel of Niels Pollitt. And Rick Zabel with the beard is looking around, searching for Marcel Kittel, who has spent so much energy in the last five kilometres to get into this position. Meanwhile, all the other sprinters have been at the front waiting for their moments. Kittel unable to follow Pollitt. He's now dropping back. Kittel is now losing positions. He's being passed by a number of riders, not even sprinters. Not looking good for Kittel. Does not have the legs of 12 months ago. Quite clearly, Marcel Kittel. 500 metres to that tight right-hander. As they race into Chartres, only a few more hundred metres to get yourself at the front and stay there. That corner's so tight, they're going to slow right down. The elastic band's going to stretch as they come out of it. Christophe Laporte is being brought on the right-hand side by Cofidis in the red.
He crashed on stage two on that final corner. He wants to get through this one safely. He's a little bit too close to the front, through the corner, and then look for some wheels to sit. I just spotted Daryl Impey trying to make a run towards the front. Here's that right-hand corner, Cofidis lead. Laporte in second position. Everybody holds their breath. So far through safely. Everybody through that corner safely. Look how narrow. It's not your normal sort of corner. It's a double right-hander. They're through cleanly, very low speeds. A few over that bump in the road, that hole in the road. Danger for a puncture in these last couple of kilometres. Cofidis in control, but Laporte only has one man in front of him. Who has the numbers? UAE for Alexander Kristoff start to bring him to the front. And Groupama FTJ for Arnold Demar. They're in a good spot. Quick step, they're there as well for Gavinia. And this is Renshaw who now hits the front. And Peter Sagan is stalking Fernando Gaviria. Renshaw on the front. Bumps with Deegan Kolb, does Sagan at the back. Renshaw a big turn of pace. This is early for him, but if they've got Cavendish in position, just keep the pace high. The road dips down now. It is a downhill through one kilometre to go. It flattens out briefly as they come around to their left. The road will swing back to the right, and then in front of them, they'll see the hill. 700 metres to go. It kicks up. Sinkeldom is now on the front, doing the lead out for Arno Demar. The Belgium national champion, Yves Lampart, the yellow colours, he's on the right, Richezzi is going early in blue, Alaphilippe is also at the front for quick step, Demar waits, it's Richezzi who now goes, he tries to launch Gaviria for number three, the fight is on, Demar shoulder to shoulder with Peter Sagan, Christoph is trying to get in there, Richezzi, this is a long way, Gaviria is waiting, Christoph is coming, Gaviria goes, Sagan sticking with him, it's Gaviria with his nose in front, Grunewagen around the outside, Gaviria, Grunewagen, it's Dylan, who does it? Grunewagen takes success again. He silenced the critics in the process. What an outstanding... An incredible win by the Dutchman. We'd said before the tour, intrinsically, he seems to be the fastest. He couldn't get himself in position. It's the first time we've seen Lotto and El Yumbo get him to the front, give him a fighting chance. Christoph tried to go. Grunewagen came out of the wheel and rounded up Gaviria. Let's watch it from the air. Gaviria on the right, Sagan follows. Grunewagen, he just steps out into the wind. Little curve, he sees he's got the momentum. He's up and over the top. Cavendish, he slipped a gear as well. His legs just aren't where they should be. And Grunewagen wins going away. Brilliant win. All the chasing at the start for Lotto and El Jumbo more than justified he paid them back you like that silencing the critics love it Cavendish was close until about 100 meters to go and then he may not have even made it inside the top ten. Gaviria in second, Sagan again in third. Another top three finish for Peter Sagan. Extraordinary. It is Bastille Day and the sun is shining. The Cateau Julier, will we see the French attack? Surely we will for stage eight of the Tour de France. This is Matthew Keenan with you as we'll wait to see whether the sprinters once again will have their day. The race heads north today and actually not too far away from Paris. It starts in Drew, makes its way through to Amiens. It is a day of 181 kilometres. Two Category 4 climbs fairly early on in the stage. The sprint at the midway point for the green jersey. The bonus sprint for time in the battle for the yellow jersey towards the back end. And then the run into Amiens. There are so many stages that suit Peter Sagan. And even the ones that don't suit him, he does well on. 
We spoke about the GC contenders, the riders, the specialists of the Ardennes Classic being the favourites for the stage of Muda Britannia. And Peter Sagan still gets himself up amongst there in eighth place, taking more points for the green jersey. And that's why he's been the man to beat for the last few years. And that run of wins in the green jersey competition only broken last year when he was ejected from the tour on stage three. But now he's back for number six and he's looking like he's in control. There's a chance that Gaviria could overhaul him on, at today's finish if Peter Sagan f finishes outside the top ten, which I doubt. Well, he hasn't finished outside the top ten yet. In how many years? <laughs> <laughs> so far today. Let's now have another listen to Roger Hammond. He's spoken just a couple of moments ago about tomorrow's stage. As a podium finisher in Paris-Roubaix yourself, how much of an impact do you think tomorrow's going to have on the overall classification? Well, I think it's, it's got the potential. I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, what I always say about my preparation for Roubaix is that one of the biggest advantages I had is I wasn't afraid of it. And, um, you know, you can relax and, and just concentrate on riding your bike as fast as you can, whereas I think these GC, there's a lot of GT guys that are going in quite afraid. So that always already, already makes them tense and, and nervous, and, and then you ride your bike in a different way with the potential to have a huge amount of impact. You know, you, you get it wrong once and either race over or, or minute. I know I saw one of the GT guys saying it. We were talking about seconds, but when we get to the mountains, it'll be minutes. Well, I personally think there's potential to lose minutes tomorrow as well. Roger Hammond, the sports director for Dimension Data. He finished in third position in Paris-Roubaix in 2004 when it was Magnus Bagstead who managed to win the race that year. Tristan Hoffman was in second position. But Roger Hammond, he knows those roads well, and he's made the same point effectively that Tom Southern made before the race got underway. There's a chance riders can lose a massive amount of time tomorrow. And also the fact that they change the way they ride in some races by comparison to just going about their business as they normally do which is also something that dan martin has drawn our attention to he has said that you can ride with the same guys all year long but come the tour de france they ride a little more differently a little differently they're a bit tenser not making the calm decisions that they will for the rest of the season and that's going to just add to the tension tomorrow well, as Roger Hammond said, there's riders that go in fearing it and their thought process is try not to lose too much time. We have others going into it thinking try to gain as much time on my rivals as possible. Nibali is one of those. And it's a very different mindset which really affects then how you perform physically, the decisions you make during the stage. The other rider who's well placed in the uh, general classification, in fact, second overall, Geraint Thomas, he'll be looking forward to tomorrow to potentially take some time on the other men that have got hopes for yellow. Three teams at the front of the peloton doing the pacemaking. The two Lottos, Lotto NL Jumbo in the black and yellow, Lotto Sudal in the red and quick step. And there's the division of the pacemaking. More work being done by Lotto Sudal than anyone else. But that seems logical because for a fair portion of the stage, the man who's been at the front has been Thomas de Gent, And you wouldn't expect anything less. This is Antoine Tollhook from Lotto NL Jumbo. Yeah, Le Venendout at the moment is the rider from Lotto Sudal, who's up towards the front. He's the rider that sits in third position. Meanwhile, down at the back of the peloton, they're just cruising through the motions for now. 167 with his armour, that was Timo Rusen, one of the important lead out riders for Dylan Grunewag and yesterday's stage winner. Our two leaders still at 3 minutes and 12 seconds in front, it's just slowly coming down. It's half of what their maximum lead was. Maximum lead they had, it got out to 6 minutes and 33 seconds. 
There's the average speeds over there. Two hours in the breakaway. 40 kilometres per hour for the first hour. 39 kilometres per hour for the second hour. The anticipated average speeds for today's stage, according to the race organisers, fastest expected speed, 48 kilometres per hour. Slowest expected speed, 44 kilometres per hour. So they're a long way behind that. Before the stage got underway, Dan Martin said that the race organisers actually need to be more realistic about the race speed, and then they wouldn't be behind schedule. Number 14, Danny Martinez, having a chat to his team leader, and last year's second place finisher, Rigoberto Uran. Amongst the many Colombians in this race. We're talking about Colombians as potential winners of the race overall. Quintana, as well as Rigoberto Uran, and winning sprint stages now with Fernando Gaviria. Nature break time for Greg Van Avermaet in the yellow jersey. Well, mate, you mentioned the Colombians and been so famous for their exploits, exploits in the high mountains over the last 30-odd oh, years in the Tour de France when they, when they first started making an impact. But Fernando Gaviria, he's cut from a different cloth and he'd really love to get the Colombians to love sprints. He's going about it the right way. He said they, they normally tune into just the mountain stages because that's where they can see Colombian riders performing well. But I'd love to get them tuning in throughout the whole Tour de France with what I'm doing in the sprints. And I think he's won over a lot of fans. I know he certainly won me over as a fan because I love to watch the way he goes to work. Super professional. And for a guy who's just 23 year, years old, he just oozes experience. 9.7. Approaching the sprint for the time bonus, but the time bonus is insignificant for these two. As it gets inside 30 seconds, it all depends on how far, how hard they're prepared to fight, how long they want to stay in front and make the peloton battle to bring them back. Just fight for every second. Could be a difference of five or six kilometres, depending on how hard they decide to ride, when they pretty much know they're going to be caught. This is the centre of Amiens. And that's the cathedral. Huge Gothic cathedral here in Amiens. It is enormous. It's 145 metres long. The spire goes up some 112 metres. There's a lot of churches and cathedrals in France called Cathedral Notre Dame. This is one of the most impressive. And one of the most significant. It's World Heritage listed by UNESCO and it collected that status back in 1981. And when we drove into the town last night, we knew there was a cathedral in Amiens, but we didn't know it was this big until we got here last night, and it really did catch our attention. And fortunately, it was spared a lot of the damage throughout the First and the Second World War. It did have a bit of reconstruction work that was required, but the rest of the town, as you can see from the aerial shot, would suffer a lot of damage and there's plenty of newish looking buildings through the bonus sprint point bonus time that is so marco minar has had three seconds taken off his time in the general classification so he now goes from eight minutes and 16 seconds behind to eight minutes and 13 seconds behind Australia collecting a two second time bonus well, let's see who is interested in that one second that remains in the peloton Quick step all over the front at the moment. Big fun Avermaet there in the yellow jersey, about ninth position, 500 I, metres out. I wonder if Quick Step will just construct it so Julian Alaphilippe goes across the finish line first of the peloton to get a one second time bonus. Because he's the, the rider on that team who is nearest to the yellow jersey. A few more BMC riders coming up along the side. Mickey Shad. Is that Kung behind him yes. and Van Avermaet? Here they go. Well, Van Avermaet wants the one second time bonus to defend it more easily tomorrow. Well, if you look over his shoulder, he'll realise, there he goes, doesn't need to do a sprint. He'll be able to tell his teammates, sit up, it's fine. 
and now they put the brakes on to make sure that it's Greg Van Avermaet who gets that one second time bonus. So he goes from being six seconds in front of Geraint Thomas to seven seconds in front. Again, though, it tells us the story of Greg Van Avermaet wanting to defend that yellow jersey tomorrow. And there is the fear that that could leave Richie Port without the assistance of Greg Van Avermaet. We look at Le Portilonage here in Amiens, this lake just outside the city. It's been a well manicured garden and lake within the city of Amiens since the Middle Ages. Market garden down there as well. No need to go too far to collect your vegetables. This is the 18th time a stage of the Tour de France has visited Amiens. It is also the hometown of the current French president, Emmanuel Macron, who to celebrate the one year anniversary of his position as the president of France, went back to his local school. Brilliant for the direct energy team. Sits on the wheel of Marco Minard. Minard has been doing slightly more work but it hasn't been through a lack of effort from Fabien Grillier. It's not as if the Frenchman has been a passenger. There's confirmation of the one second time bonus for the yellow jersey wearer, Greg Van Avermaet. One of the big discussion points around all of the riders from BMC is what are they doing next year? BMC is a team that's looking for a new sponsor. Lots of questions about that being asked of the team manager, Jim Okovitz. There's been articles saying that Richie Porter signed a two-year contract with the Trek Segafredo team. There was also an article today in the French newspaper, Le Keep, saying that Aqua Blue, the Irish team, are very interested in Richie Port. I'm sure they're interested, but can they sign him? Do they have the cash? Do they have the, the cash? Front? Do they have the team infrastructure required? In any case, a change at the front with 17 and a half kilometres to go. Dimension Data getting involved, and now Robert Kiesink from Lotto NL Jumbo. We wondered if he would make an appearance. We've seen Tollhook for that team do a lot of the chasing. It's now Kiesink looks at least like him from a distance, and the man who's done a lot of work in his first week. So they're on a high, confidence-wise, after the win of Dylan Grunewagen yesterday. Crash in the peloton. It's a fair way back down the line, but that is a heavy fall. Mark Soler has been caught behind it. Ian Boswell has also been caught behind it. That's a Lotto and El Yumbo rider on the ground. The black jersey with the yellow sleeves. Also down here is the King of the Mountains jersey's fallen down. That's Kochikov of the Katusha team. Tony Top Martins. Scoring. Tony Martin, Julian Alaphilippe, the rider who's the best placed overall for Quick Step. He sits in fourth position in the general classification. A lot of riders from UAE are waiting. That's Darwin Atapuma. Dan Martin. Dan Martin. Rory Sutherland is calling. They're trying to get themselves organised. That's bad news for Dan Martin. Dan Martin is hurt. This rider that we see is Timo Rosen from Lotto and El Jumbo, a key lead out man for Dylan Grunewagen. Dan Martin is tough, we know that. He's off and away again. He's got a new bike or replacement. But look at the blood on the elbow of Martin, it ripped all over his back, the back of his shorts. So Dan Martin now has a lot of work to do to get back in contact with the bunch because the chase is on behind our two breakaway riders and one of our contenders. And a winner on the Mood of Britannia has gone down in that mass pileup. And in career best form. So disappointing for Dan Martin. He had an awful crash on stage nine last year. He was involved in the fall of Richie Port as Julian Alaphilippe does not have a broken collarbone. But he is testing the ligaments. Now look like he's just trying to crack his back. So he may have uh, just hurt his spine a little bit there. Some of his ribs possibly. This is Tom's Skoinch. 
no danger for him to lose his jersey today. He's just trying to get back on the back of the UAE team. Emirates were trying to drag Dan Martin back into contention. They have got a big job ahead of them to get back on. This could be disaster for the Irishman. They haven't even really started the chase in earnest yet because Dan Martin is doing the quick self-assessment and he does not look good. That looks really sore. Julian Alaphilippe, well, doesn't look like he is going to be able to get back on, and he's stretching just about every part of his body, trying to crack his back, shake it out of the knee as well. So Alaphilippe, he can't rely on a bunch of teammates to come back and get him. They're up there riding for Fernando Gaviria. Alaphilippe is not a big contender for the yellow jersey in Paris, so I think they'll leave him behind. Huge gap now for Dan Martin. He has got a lot of ground to try and make up. That will be really difficult for the Irishman to close down that gap because there's no waiting now at the front of the race. Our two breakaway riders, Marco Minar and Fabian Grillier, they'll be caught fairly shortly. The peloton is not waiting for any of those victims of the fall. Dan Martin is one kilometre behind on the road. And Alaphilippe sitting on the wheel of Franco Palazzotti. Here comes Dan Martin. Rory Sutherland leading the charge for the group of the Irishmen. Can Alaphilippe get onto the wheel of Damien Goudon? Yes, he can. And they'll be really hoping that they get a convoy in front of them. The official's car and the medic's car, they're bringing the convoy through. This is good news for Dan Martin. This gives him a fighting chance of getting back to the peloton. And the fact that it's a headwind gives him an even better chance. What they need is some of those cars when they come past, just not to go by quite so quickly. And if a team car comes past, we've seen it already in this tour try to just provide a little more strip strip, slipstream when they can, but they've got to be careful because we've seen Tom Dumoulin penalise 20 seconds for staying behind the team car for too long. Get away with a little bit more when it's somebody else's team car as opposed to your team car. Team Sky on the left-hand side of the road. Dan Martin one kilometre behind the peloton. A minute and 28 seconds. The group of Dan Martin with his UAE Team Emirates Teammates like Rory Sutherland, they are riding a team's time trial now, trying to get the Irishman back in the bunch. These two, they're trying to stay away from the bunch. 36 seconds, still their lead with 13 and a half kilometres to go. And this is a group of the chasers at number 76, that's JJ Rojas. And well, Poles, he won't be too worried. He's caught behind it, but he'll be content with conceding more time today. Damien Housen in that group as well. This is a group that's not bothered about getting back onto the peloton. Housen, Pools, we've already spoken about them. They need to be fresh for the mountains. The most important thing is they weren't caught in the crash that sent them onto the ground. You see riders coming out of that same group. They're tacking onto the back of UAE Team Emirates with Dan Martin because they see a free ride back to the peloton. And Ian Boswell, the red colours of Katusha. Likewise, Rick Zabel. They're getting onto the back of the UAE Emirates train. This is Troyer on the front from Team Emirates. Who has the throttle fully open. Have two leaders at 30 seconds ahead of the peloton. Dan Martin's group is 1.1 kilometres behind the peloton. But, as you mentioned before, that convoy of cars, that gives him more of a chance of getting back. But how much damage is done physically, even if he doesn't lose any time today? That is the big question. Other teams getting up to the front on the right-hand side. Mitchelton Scott, two riders in front of Adam Yates. Looks like Jack Bauer and Matthew Heyman, who are getting Yates up the front, trying to keep him out of harm's way. He's avoided that crash. But as we've seen on other stages this week, can happen so quickly that happened within the final 10 kilometers and if they're outside three kilometers to go you have to hustle get back on try get back in contact once inside three kilometers to go you're safe you'll get the same time but until then the stress is high other riders missing from the front chasing to try and get back on there's no Astana Jakob Fulsan is off the back and Trek Segafredo, they're also missing as they're trying to bring Balko Molima back to the peloton. Peter Sagan on the left-hand side, just behind Team Sky, or on the extreme left. Chris Froome, safe and sound. Groupama FDG now hitting the front. As this group with Dan Martin, they're getting back to the convoy. They will get back. Like you said, though, the question is, 
What's the physical damage to Dan Martin from that crash? That, that is the real, This is the real worry. This number 16 going through is Pierre Rolland. Just in front of him in white with a pat on the back. That's Bolka Molima. That's the group that's just returned. So they were also caught behind the this, crash, this Molima. Is, this is not the Dan Martin group. This is the group that contained Jakob Fulsang and Bolka Molima. Dan Martin is still more than one minute behind the peloton. Uh, this is an in-between group that we hadn't yet seen. So Mikael Nieve is there as well. Michael Hepburn. Jakob Fulsang and Bolka Molima, the two significant figures that were in that group that rejoined. Here is the chase. Troyer and Sutherland, the two big powerhouses for UAE Emirates. Rory Sutherland in the centre of the picture on debut is learning all about being a domestic at the Tour de France today. Well, this is becoming very difficult for UAE Team Emirates now because we have come into the final 10 kilometres of the stage. The speed is only going to go up as the sprinters' teams start to jostle for position. General classification contenders want to stay near the front. It just brings the speed up, makes that chase a lot harder for those teams to come back. They are spread all across the road, but that's because teams are trying to move to the front. On the right, it's Mitchelton Scott. To the left, Sky and Dimension Data. Minar has surrendered. Drillia goes on. Well, that could mean that's the red number for Grillier. That is sometimes the difference when it's hard to pick. It's just who lasts the longest and how much they want to fight for it to stay in front. Now Dan Martin is at roughly 700 metres. Looks like the pace has gone off at the front of the peloton. Looks like a relative truce at the moment. So that's good news for Dan Martin. And that's despite there's a bit of crosswind at this point. Well, the pace really has gone out of the peloton. So it looks as though it might have been set at the front of the bunch. We know there's been a big crash. Let's let the victims return. Because they know they've got the breakaway under control. Had they just continued, they would have caught them with 9.7 kilometres to go. But now they've got one man, 21 seconds in front, just inside 10k to go. And they're all lining up in their teams. Jersey, the centre of the road, he's actually surrounded by his teammates, as opposed to letting them do the work at the front and him freelancing wherever he likes. Gap at the moment, still saying it's one. This is the group with Dan Martin. He's at the tail end of the group of the riders in the black and white colours. He sits on the wheel of Dale Natapuma. There is the Irishman, number 91. A look at the speed differential here to the peloton. I'm not sure it's still a minute to the peloton. I'm sure they're making up substantial ground on the bunch at the moment. And Dan Martin will already be thinking to himself, what have I done in that crash? And we'll only find out the answer to that when the team releases the information after he visits the doctors post this stage. However, Dan Martin last year showed just how tough he is. The crash that he was involved in with Richie Port looked even worse than the one today. And today's wasn't good. And he still fought on to finish in sixth position. Just because Dan Martin has had a horrible crash today, don't write him off for a top five. No way in the world. He's certainly tough. Dan Martin already got a stage win in the bag on this Tour de France, on the Mur de Bretagne. And last year, as you said, rode on with injury. Two fractured transverse process. Little bones off the vertebrae. And it's extremely painful. Rode the rest of the tour with it and acquitted himself very, very well. Still being signalled at a minute behind the peloton. I find hard to believe. I think that they're getting close. The speed difference. They look to be going much quicker than the peloton, although perhaps, as is often the case, the TV can be a little deceiving. They are spread out across the road, but they're not exactly going slowly, that peloton. 40 kilometres an hour at the moment, a little uphill drag that brings them into the edge of the city. Just over eight kilometres to go, and Grelier hovering at around 14, 15 seconds ahead of the peloton for the sprinters teams they can see him race radio 
saying the time check to Dan Martin is 40 seconds. That's to the front of the peloton, but it's not particularly long, the peloton. It's not as if it's strung out in single file. 630 metres behind the peloton. That's still some work to do. And the pace on now. There's the catch of Fabian Grelier and it's team Lotto Sudal for Andre Greipel. Dimension data for Mark Cavendish. Getting themselves to the front and on the left-hand side in the black and white is Team Sky bringing Chris Froome through towards the finish in safety. But all the corners are still to come. And the yellow jersey, Greg Van Avermaet. He's got Richie Port tucked in underneath his wing. Sky doing exactly what they did yesterday, going to the front, stringing it out. Faster at this point for Team Sky is safer. And after straight roads for so long, the first corner on the way into the city here in Amiens, all through safely, it strings out the front, the pace goes up again, and it's Team Sky on a sprint stage who are leading out at the moment. The sprinters teams waiting in the wings to take over. Team UAE Emirates, they're just trying to get Dan Martin back to that bunch. Here's that same right-hand corner. So still some 38 seconds behind the peloton. And the rider that leads them around the corner, that is Roberto Ferrari. So he's the lead-out man normally in the sprint finishes for Alexander Kristoff. So UAE showing that Dan Martin is their priority. Well, there was Kristoff on his own. He was the man that just threw the bidon away with five kilometres to go. He's in the white jersey of European champion. So he will have to surf his way to the finish and find himself a lead out with another team. He's the only rider from that team who has not waited for Dan Martin. The rider that just got dropped was Marco Minard. Well, the pace that's on now, it's going to be very difficult for them to close any more of that gap. And in fact, it could even stretch back out and put Dan Martin at nearly a minute because the time is taken of the winner across the finish line. So that will just extend that gap. And then there's also traffic for them to negotiate. The riders getting dropped. They can disrupt the rhythm. Corfidis, they're doing the chasing as well. They're supporting the chase, but there's no chance for Christophe Laporte now with this much work to And the do. peloton is definitely moving faster than this group. They could see them just in the distance, but now Groupama FDG go to the front for Arnaud Demar. Can a Frenchman get the win on Bastille Day? Or will it be the German Andre Greipel like last time we visited Amiens? Four kilometres to go, and the lead-out trains are starting. A tight corner coming up, left-hander. All through smooth and safe. Downhill run to three kilometres to go. Sharp right-hand turn, uneven road surface. The elbow looks so sore already for Dan Martin. He's still at 42 seconds behind. And he's starting to run out of teammates. The rider at the front now is Christian Jurasek. Dan Martin is doing the best thing possible. He's riding with his teammates. Don't just sit behind and wait to see how close they can get you. If you possibly can contribute, they're now 44 seconds behind. The pace on this is Philippe Gilbert gone to the front and actually going off the front at the moment, Gilbert. I'm not sure it's deliberately off the front. He's just setting a high tempo, heading towards the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Well, this section downhill, there's a big roundabout. It's more a switch to the right and back to the left. Brings them down to three kilometres to go. Narrows a little bit. And then this next corner is very sharp. They were still doing roadworks this morning at this point. They're about to swing into it now. And Gilbert leads them through. And that looked like Moscon or Kwiatkowski that was getting out of the way for Team Sky. And Gilbert threw the corner so much quicker than the men behind him. This is now a full-blooded attack. This is no lead-out. This is Gilbert trying to win the stage and see if he can take the jersey. But Dimension Data there on the front. Edouard Boss and Hagen, he's not letting Gilbert go. It's Eddie the boss, but he's not the boss today. He's the lieutenant. It's Cavendish they're doing the job for. Gilbert, however, will take some catching. Well, Renshaw in second position, Cavendish a lot further back. Peter Sagan, three positions in front of him. So Cavendish's team is doing the work. He's in about 20th spot. Grunewagen's team now bring him up, and he slots in. He's found his mark. Three kilometres remaining. Incidentally, Dan Martin, well, he's at three kilometres, two kilometres at the front. The Irishman is one kilometre behind. The gap is it's opening back up. Getting bigger. Huge time losses for Dan Martin today. And Gilbert is only 10 metres off the front. 
but he's not so easy to catch. He's not easy to catch, but here comes a more concerted chase now. Lotto Sudal, they say that's enough. We've got to close this down, 1.7 kilometres to go. This is the final line through to the finish. They've already had the, the last corner. In fact, they've caught Gilbert. Now Lotto Sudala coming to the front for Andre Greipel. Marcel Seberg now takes over. The big figure of Marcel Seberg on the front. De Burst, De Burst in second position. This is too early for Marcel Seberg though. Seberg needs to be able to get them at least to 500 metres to go. And there's so many riders waiting behind to pull their sprinters to the front. Dan Martin and his teammates through two kilometres to go as the peloton are under the red kite. 1,000 metres to ride. Peter Sagan on left of screen. Cavendish is tracking him. And the French are getting excited. They're in with a chance with Arnaud Demar. The pushing and the shoving. Andre Greipel is fighting for his wheels. Here comes Anderson, the white jersey. Nicky Azan is in there as well for Sunweb. It's now Groupama FDJ who take over. Where's Demar? He's not in the wheel of his teammates, but Andre Greipel is. Andre Greipel is waiting to pounce. He won here three years ago. It's Guneri leading out as Richezzi is looking for Gaviria. Gaviria now is on to the wheel of Sagan. He slips up the inside. Peter Sagan in green. Gaviria and Greipel bumping. It's Sagan who is still charging. Grunewagen is trying to get there. Greipel fights on. Gaviria, Grunewagen, Grunewagen. You make that two. So much happened in the final 200 metres. Well, Matt, all the best sprinters of this Tour de France got a crack at it, except for Marcel Kittel. Cavendish has dropped his chain in the background, got it back on. He was out of it. Peter Sagan, he took lengths. Greipel lined him up. He comes out of the wheel, and again, he has to sit. He blows up. Grunewagen, oh, so comfortably over the top. Clear win for Grunewagen. Head on, it looks so much closer. But the Dutchman, he is just on a roll, carrying that momentum from yesterday. Two in a row for Grunewagen. And here comes Dan Martin. What are the time losses today? The lack of luck for the Irish, caught up in a little bit of traffic as well. Martin sprinting for the line, so too Atapuma. Whichever rider from this group gets to the line first, that's where the clock will stop for all of them. The commitment from Atapuma. Jurasek is in second position, and the others, they just watch on. It's already ticked over more than a minute. One minute and 14 seconds. The time loss today for Dan Martin. Yesterday, the victory salute was the fingers to the lips. This is just pure happiness from Grunewagen. Over the top, he lined them up, got in the slipstream, knew he's got it, and he sits up to claim it here in Amiens. Andre Greipel hangs in for second with a throw. Gavidia third, and Grunewagen now, he says, I'm number one because I've got two. Well, so is Gaviria and so is Sagan, but Grunewagen has got two in a row. Three in total for his career with the one that he got last year, but today, that was so convincing. From the front, you could tell he was coming, and coming quick, the aerial shot, no words needed. Bastille Day, the celebrations get started, and the rubbing of the shoulders between Andre Greipel and Fernando Gaviria, there'll be more to tell about that, no doubt, after the stage. Well, that one certainly was dramatic. A hundred stories in the final few hundred metres. After a day of procession until the final 25 k's or so, then it was most definitely on. <laughs> It's the best pair of legs we've seen from Andre Greipel today. He might be ruining 
some of the battling that he had to do in the last 500 meters you can't help but wonder how much energy was lost in the process all that battling and grinding with Fernando Gaviria Gaviria fought his way back and got up for third place so those two that were bumping and grinding now the yellow jersey for Greg Van Avermaet. If the previous two stages could be classified as calm, Sunday the storm arrives. It's the venture through hell. It's the road to Roubaix. It's stage nine of the Tour de France on a day where anything could happen. Hello and welcome to the coverage. Matthew Keenan and Robbie McEwen with you. They're just about ready to race. It's not the profile that matters on the stage from Arras through to Roubaix, it is the cobblestones. This is a day where there is 21.7 kilometers worth of pavé and there are 15 sectors in total. It's only 156 kilometers, but these could be the most brutal kilometers of the entire race. Robbie McEwen, today is one of those days where just perhaps the riders doing battle for the yellow jersey could find themselves losing more time than what they will in the high mountains. Battle for the yellow jersey and just a battle for survival. Certainly there'll be riders who see their hopes of winning this Tour de France go up in dust, not smoke, because that's what it is out there today. It has been hot and dry in this part of northern France for almost two months. Very little rainfall today. It's going to be choking. It's going to be hard to see where anybody is. It's going to be hard to find your way. And that's going to be one of the big obstacles. But of course, the cobbles themselves, they are going to shake this race to pieces. This is the Grand Place on Arras, which is hosting the stage start today. And it's going to witness history in the Tour de France, as this is a plaza that has witnessed more than 1,000 years of history. It was the grain market from 1860, but that disappeared between the two world wars. And the Grand Place was unfortunately destroyed by German bombs throughout the First World War. And then after the wars, following the support of the local municipality and the federal government, the square was rebuilt as it was before. Seven minutes before they roll out for the neutral zone, and the neutral zone today is 7.6 kilometres. And throughout the neutral zone for the first seven road stages, we've seen a fairly relaxed peloton. Today, there'll be a lot more riders fighting for a position up towards the front. Yellow Jersey Group is just on around about 1,200 metres away from the next cobblestone sector. Nine riders out in front. No threats for the general classification, but they're not out here to battle for yellow. They're out here, some, to be in a position to help a teammate later, like the man in the black and white colours, Chad Hager, the American. He's riding in support of Tom Dumoulin. Others, like the three men from Direct Energy, are out there to try and win the stage. And here comes one of their teammates, 188 Rain Taramay, after a mechanical problem, returning to the rear end of the field. And in pink, Chad Hager, the American, is still there, no problem. Bahrain Merida starting to mass towards the front. Vincenzo Nibali easily surviving those first couple of sectors. The next two-star sector, sector 13. Breakaway now swings onto that, and look how narrow it is. Gravel on the inside, so danger for the peloton. Come there quickly, that little curve to the left here on the inside. It's a dangerous little spot, so things that you don't even think about, you don't consider that sector to be dangerous. It's only two stars, it's a long way from the finish. Small things make such a big change to your race plan. They can really turn it around very, very quickly. You can see all the helpers on either side of the road with spare wheels in case somebody from that team has a puncher and there's no access for the team car to be able to get up there. Well, you saw that little graphic, 21.7 kilometres of cobbles on this stage. They've already done just over four kilometres of cobbles. This one's 900 metres long. 
but it's the next one. There's a fair break in between, about 16 and a half kilometres until we get the next sector, sector 12, to Brilon. That's a three-star sector, and it's 2,000 long. More importantly, one kilometre after the finish of that sector, Sasso Rossier, 2.4 kilometres. That is a very tough sector. That's where I think the race is really going to blow apart. And it's from after this one as they exit sector 13, so 12 still to go. They've now got 17 and a half kilometres before the next sector, and that's when it gets really nasty, and they come in really quick succession. More of the team helpers on the other side of the cobblestones, making sure their men stay well hydrated. The blue colours of Quickstep now go into the front of the peloton. This is a race that that team has won so many times in the past. Heinrich Halsler in the red colours of Bahrain Merida. He leads the main field. And the squeeze is on through that corner with a couple of riders. In fact, now a couple more. Four riders taking a shortcut. That's dangerous for the spectators. And you're actually not allowed to ride on the footpath. Three twenty-nine for our ten-man group in front. A few riders choosing the straight line through the roundabout. Eighty-six and a half kilometres to go. The feed zone in another eight kilometres, and it'll be from then. It'll be really on to hold position, going to that sector twelve, two thousand metres long. Very quickly followed by two and a half kilometre sector, and they just keep rolling on. And all of these sectors, right through to the last one in M, are all true Paris-Roubaix pave sectors. This is at the back of the race again. There's been a lot of problems for the riders from AG to R Le Mondial. This is one of their climbing support riders, Matthias Frank himself. He's been a top 10 finisher in the Tour de France previously. He's here to support Roman once they get to the high mountains. And seeing the damage that's been done today to Matthias Frank explains why a guy like Damien Housen is staying out of trouble today, not getting involved in the battle for positions, because he's trying to help Adam Yates when they get to the mountains. And the good news for a guy like Damien Housen, also for Walt Pools, who's doing the same sort of things, see riders come through the inside of that corner. Stand back, ladies and gentlemen. As you said, mate, you're not allowed to ride on the footpaths. Often there's a penalty. There's that little section with the gravel. It's slippery. Look at how much slower again it is at the back, and they have to spend a lot more energy to get up to the same speed as the front end of the race. I was just watching the body language on the riders who were on that inside. You could see them just tighten up a little bit, straight line it just slightly to get back onto the cobbles without the gravel on there. Avoid an accident. Everybody there got through cleanly. Look that gap down a little bit again, just to 3.20, a few seconds off. The time comes off on that approach to the cobblestones, not necessarily on the cobblestones. Lucas Postelberger is the rider at the front. Bora Hansgrohe, rightly so, is super confident about Peter Sagan being able to win the stage today. This is defensive riding on the front in the peloton from Bora Hansgrohe, just being in position, staying in control. I can guarantee you the fight's going to get a lot more intense when they're going to come to sector 12 with 70 kilometres to go. That is deep into the finale. When you're talking about a stage like this, or a race like Paris-Roubaix, we talk about the finale in Paris-Roubaix, beginning with over 100 kilometres to go. They're well inside that now. The toughest sectors are ahead of them. And they get off the end of this, 16 and a half kilometres, until they start the first serious sector of Pave. The fluoro yellow, that's one of the team helpers for Sky, off to the side of the road. Postelberger, job done across the Pave. Lawson Craddock just keeps on doing his thing. You see, each team has helpers along the side of the road. You see them, they're the ones holding the wheels in the air. And a problem here for one of the Mitchelton Scott riders. That was... Durbridge and also involved in this at the back. That's Dylan Grunewagen, the winner of the stage yesterday. Lawrence Ten Dam is with him from the Sunweb team. Disappointment for Grunewagen, potential stage winner today. And number 66, Damien Hausen, he has sacrificed his bike for Luke Durbridge. And Luke Durbridge is one of the riders that can help today for Adam Yates. There goes the bike of Dylan Grunewagen. Did you see the front of that bike, Matt? Handlebars snapped off, I think, through the stem. 
Don't know exactly how it's happened. One of the Sunweb riders also involved, that's Lawrence Tendam. So the winner from the last two days, Dylan Grunebegen. All the ups and the downs of the Tour de France. Just radioing back to the team. Looks like he's going to be okay, the medical team. Leaving him be, he says, I'm okay. He's a solid boy, Dylan Grunebegen. Won't be in contention for this stage, but uh, that hasn't left him undamaged. Looks like he's really hurt that left thigh. A bit of blood on the knee as well. Such a convincing winner yesterday, and he wasn't without a chance to win a game today. Well, if he can just get himself through to the end of the stage, make it within the time limit. It's a rest day tomorrow, assess the damage, and uh, hopefully for him, he'll be able to take further part, get himself through the mountain stages. The winner on the Champs-Élysées last year. Back to the front of the race, Greg Van Avermaet in yellow. Stefan Kung in front of him, and TJ Van Garderen riding in the wheel. Grunewegen, new bike, he's away. And BMC, disappointment today with the abandonment, that heavy crash for Richie Port. But they've still got the yellow jersey, and the next wearer of the yellow jersey could still be riding for BMC in the mountains. TJ Van Garderen. He definitely could. Grunewegen back underway. And although it's 16 and a half kilometres to the next section, they go through the feed zone, Grunewegen could find himself completely out of the convoy and riding in alone over the next 82.5 kilometres. Katusha at the front, Marcel Kittel on the right in the red. He was just on the front of So Kittel, the team has worked for him throughout the first eight days of this race. A third and a fifth place, but by his standards, unsuccessful. Now, he's doing his part for the team. Been highly criticised by his team director, Dmitry Konishev. He's trying to show that he can, that he is a worthwhile member of this team. 1,466 kilometres covered so far of this Tour de France of the 3,351. This is Le Beffroi in Douai. And the construction of this one dates back to 1380 and it replaces an old wooden tower. This stands at the top of the beautiful Gothic Cathedral. In 1917, the bell itself was actually melted down by the occupying forces and it was recast in 1924. As you can well imagine, throughout the First World War and the Second World War, this part of the country, as we rode through the Somme yesterday, suffered significant damage and enormous amounts of casualties. A little bit of calm returns at the front of the peloton as they've still got 11 kilometres before they hit the next really dangerous section. And as we look at that time gap, we've seen it come down every time the peloton are on approach to a cobbled sector. Once they get about halfway across it, the gap begins to grow again. So it just shows that Bora Hansgrohe riding for position, just staying in control, throttling back, the breakaway starts to take some of that time back and now they have a section this 16 and a half kilometers with the feed zone it's a real chance for them to push it back out over the four minute mark this is Iverti the first of the riders from Movistar taking a drink with Daniela Bernati but I also spotted at the front Sylvain Dillier, so Roman Bardet can't be too far away. Another man I spotted at the front is Mark Cavendish. We spoke about Kittle a moment ago, now working for the team. And with Rick Sarbel in his wheel at the moment. But Mark Cavendish, he's right there at the front. Hasn't been successful in the sprints. Hasn't looked anywhere near his best for a guy who's won 30 stages in the Tour de France. But he says he does love the cobbles. And he dreamt of being a classics rider. He's a pure sprinter. So the classic's really not his specialty. But he'd love to have a good crack at today's stage. And he'll be dreaming of winning a stage like this to just add yet another string to his bow. This is Dylan Grunewagen on a new bike because there's nothing the mechanic can do for the old one, except take all the parts off it and put the frame in the bin. That one is done. All he can do is give it last rights. He's two minutes behind the peloton now, Dylan Grunewagen. The time cut off today, it's classified as a coefficient two. So it depends on the average speed of the stage. 
But I'm anticipating the average speed will be somewhere in the vicinity of 45 plus kilometres per hour. So they need to get across the finish line within about 15 to 18 percent of the time of the stage winner to be able to start on Tuesday. This is our breakaway group of nine right ten in the move from Direct Energy. Number 85, Damien Goudon. 184, that is Jerome Cousin. Also in this move for them is Lillian Kalmajan, who's the best placed overall from this breakaway at four minutes and 25 seconds down. This is one of the days where the riders battling for yellow want to survive, most of them at least. One of the exceptions, though, is the winner of this race in 2014, Vincenzo Nibali. What can the Shark of Messina do today? We caught up with him before the start of the stage. Let's... He's calm. He's not wasting any energy. He's, he's always calm, and he just appears at the right moment. And on a stage like this where GC riders seem to be scrambling and look panicky, Nibali is the antithesis of that. This is the breakaway, number 122. Two. That is Omar Frale, Spanish climber who has never ridden Paris-Roubaix. Reinhardt Yanzi off to the left, a slight downhill period. He's taking a nature break. There's no chance to get more comfortable in the breakaway. Chad Hager is there for Sunweb. Reinhardt Yanzi van Rensburg, we've mentioned Frale. Legac is there for Group Armour FDJ. De Ghent there for Lotto Soudal. Kalmajan, Kuzun and Goudan there for Direct Energy. Nicola Ede for Kofidis. That rounds out the group of nine. And Matt, I was talking about them pushing that gap back out a little bit over that 16 and a half kilometre stretch between sectors. But the brakes come into the feed zone. They've all made sure they've taken food and drink on board, getting themselves organised. So in that time, they've given away about 20 seconds to the peloton. And you still see there's some intensity there at the front, just maintaining those positions. So it's not a chase. They're just making sure they stay in front of the others. And as one goes a bit faster on the left, the one on the right responds. The one's up the middle. They need to increase the pace. So it just eats away a few seconds from the breakaway as they race past. But they'll be completely unaware of Le Lac de Les Agal. Well, they'll get to see plenty of gorgeous lakes as the race heads down towards the mountains. And tonight they'll be jumping in an aeroplane and heading down to Annecy, which is famous for its gorgeous lake. Little beach that has been made on the side as well of the lake. Well, it's no Lac d'Annecy, but it's a pretty good spot to be. Warm out there today. Going to hit 30 degrees here in Roubaix. A bit of a breeze, but nothing more than that. There's not going to be crosswinds that affect the bunch. This is Valgrin. That's from the early crash that claimed Richie Port, broken right collarbone for the Tasmanian. And again, on stage nine of the Tour de France, he's out of the race, just like last year. Valgren, you can see the damage. The jersey just shrieks. Lawson Craddock's wearing number 13. He's got the number turned upside down. I wonder if Richie Port ever gets number nine in a bike race, he'll turn that upside down. No nine-man teams anymore, so I guess he's spared from that. Safe. But what a massive blow to Richie Port. Crashed out of the race last year when he's looking so good. Looked like the man to challenge Chris Froome. Bit of disappointment for Richie Port. Heartbreaking, no doubt, for him and all of his supporters. We wish him all the best with his recovery. From what we could tell, the good news is that sort of injury he'll be able to make a full recovery from. But the psychological blow is going to be huge. Well, that's what we spoke about last year, the psychological blow from that injury. That was in the mountains. Tough, this is on the flat. Tough from the shoulders up, left-hand side of the screen, red helmet, the black and the white colours from UAE Emirates, Dan Martin. Tough as nails. Now look at the pace on in the bunch now. With Jonathan Castrovejo on the front. They're around about four and a half kilometres away from the first really difficult section that runs some 2,000 metres. Well, that section starts with 70 kilometres to go. The breakaway is 3.7k away. The bunch, another two and a half minutes behind that. So around two kilometres behind the break at the speed they're riding at the moment. So although it's five and a half kilometres to that sector, Sky already making their presence felt at the front. Quick step, they're getting in amongst the train of Bora Hansgrohe as well.
forming a tandem of teams at the front and that is serving to just eat away at the lead of this group here the nine men off the front now originally 10 missing Anton Tolhook who punctured on the first sector number 35 Chad Hager he was so excited to come to the Tour de France that when he headed to the airport to come he realized halfway to the airport that he'd left his passport at home luckily because he was so excited he was way ahead of schedule and he had plenty of time to turn around go home get the passport then get to the airport to be informed that his plane was delayed and this is not one of the official cobblestone sectors this can cause a little bit of panic in the bunch because look how narrow that is whichever team can get to this little section here first right on that nice smooth piece of bike path big advantage over those who are forced out to the right to ride across the cobbles well, two and a half kilometers to go for the leading group before they hit the next sector the peloton they twist and turn their way in towards it and that gap as we see Mikhail Kwiatkowski now in the front of the peloton it's coming down not because they're chasing the breakaway because they're positioning their team leaders on well, Sky, Bora Hansgrohe, quick step floors as well in there. Froome in second position. Froome can ride the cobblestones. In 2015, he was even aggressive across the cobblestones. Geraint Thomas with the white glasses on. He is the rider who is well positioned potentially to challenge for yellow. He sits in second position overall. That little section we just saw the breakaway on, that'll come as no surprise to the riders in the peloton. Everybody has reconned this stage. That'll be why Sky are riding at the moment. I think it's a little bit far before a sector to hit the front. They'll know exactly what's coming at them. And their team director in the car, Servas Carnarvon, a former winner of Paris-Roubaix in 2001. He knows these roads as good as anybody. And while some sports directors are saying this sort of stage should never be in the Tour de France. Servais Carnarvon says it should be in every year. How much do you think that was part of the psychological game with the rivals of Chris Froome? Ooh. A little bit, but in oh, oh, the crash. Ball, and it's one of the riders from Team Sky who has gone down. It looks like Johnny Moscon who has hit the deck. A fifth place finisher across the cobblestones in 2017. Well, you'll see he just hit that going way too fast. The change from the tarmac to the cobbles, which are, it's, uh, it's uh, Bernal. Bernal. It's Egan Bernal who's gone down. No experience on the cobbles in race situations. He's gone down quite hard, but he slid. But that will hurt. Watch it here. He's wide. It he actually crashes before he hits the cobbles. Dusty. It's slippery. Egan Bernal. The youngest rider in the race, the brilliant Colombian climber, potential first winner of, of potential winner of the race in the future. Finding out his first time around France, just how challenging it is. Hopefully he's okay, but he went down and he's with his full weight fell onto the stones. He's back up and riding, and he's already back in the back of the peloton. That's the gives you an indication of the length of the peloton. Another more, crash. More problems. That's Pichon, one of the Astana riders came down as well. And one of the Copetus riders going cyclocross. And now we can feel the tension in the peloton. Kwiatkowski at the front, there he is. Oliver Nyssen, the former Belgian national champion from AG to R Le Mondial. We might start calling him Kevin Costner because he is doing the job looking after Roman Bardet. Peter Sagan doing a little bit of riding in the dirt with a tear through the shorts here. For 158. Bichot, Arthur Bichot. So Bichot gone down, Pichon as well. Didn't see which Astana rider it was, but we spoke about it earlier. The roads around this region are so slippery because of the dust. It's the cobbles, but also the normal parts of the road as well. With the breakaway now on sector 12, three star section to Brillant, 2,000 metres. And this is a true Paris Roubaix sector. It really is. This is Olivia Legac at the back of the group, who's riding a pretty small gear across the cobblestones. Save the legs, keep it turning, spin to win, thinks Legac, 43 kilometres an hour. And intelligently, just riding at the back of the group, sitting in the slipstream. Others will be thinking, I want to ride on the front, I want to stay safe, I want to lead the way, I want to see where I'm going. But if you're brave enough, it's so much easier to have less vision, but way more slipstream. 
A lot of trust in the riders in front of them. It's Chad Hager who sits just in front. And Chad Hager is riding a much bigger gear than Olivier Legac, but he's very tall as well. So he's a good slipstream for the Frenchman. For mine, he looks really comfortable as well. He looks so relaxed. Chad. Yeah. You see Legac elbows out and bumping around and bouncing. Look at Hager. So smooth, relaxed, hands in the middle of the handlebars. And he looks at ease. And looks ride, at home. And riding that slightly bigger gear than Olivia Legac, he's not bouncing around as much. It's a much smoother ride by Chad Hager. And perhaps Olivia Legac could actually go up a few cogs. Well, it's one thing to ride a small gear to save the legs, but with more revolutions, it just makes you that little bit rougher on the bike with all the bumps. So try and find that ideal cadence. And Hager looks to have it. Headwind through this section. But so often, these pave sectors, they wind and weave their way across the fields. He's finding the apex there, Legac. He's struggling to stick on the wheel. Now we go to the front. This is Mickey Shah at the front for BMC. Today, they had to make a change after just 10 kilometres. Now they're riding for the yellow jersey of Greg Van Avermaet. Well, you see Mickey Shear making the road as straight as possible, cutting through the corners, straight through that apex. Sometimes going onto the dirt, a little bit of a risk, going over the edge of those cobbles. You've always got that stone that's laid long ways at the side. You can hit those coming back on, and there's a danger for a puncture. But Mickey Shear, he knows his way around the roads of Roubaix. He's doing a great job for Greg Van Avermaet. At the front of this breakaway group of nine, it's Thomas de Gens. Six kilometres done of the cobbles of this Roubaix stage of the Tour. 15.7 to go. Charging back through the Sunweb colours, that was Edward Toings, who is strong on the cobblestones. And now Sunweb really going to business. 86 is share. He was on the front. Puncher. He's at a mechanical. He's had a problem. Team Sky. The green jersey of Peter Sagan. Number 73 is Benati. Vulcan Molliver, 191, no problems. Roman Bardet, number 21, he's towards the front. Cruz bike in the black and yellow colours. Daniel Oss from Bora Hans Grower. Number 32, that's Tom Dumoulin. He's being followed by none other than Mikael Lander. Two of the big favourites for this race. Troy up behind him and Quintana. Nardo Quintana. And as long as Quintana has the yellow jersey behind him, he'll be comfortable. Well, Quintana, I don't know, playing around with his computer on the handlebars or just not comfortable with the hand position, but uh, looking a bit ungainly. And just behind Van Avermaet was Vincenzo Nibali. Yeah, looking so cool, calm and collected. Well, I talked about Hager looking at home and smooth. Nibali was exact same. Big fall in the peloton. Gorka Izagiri is in amongst them. Cavendish there is, is there. Cavendish, he's born. And number 121, the rider from Astana, is Jakob Fulsang. One of the favourites for a top three finish in this race. He has been caught up in the fall. He's got Michael Valgren with him. And now Valgren has to do the work. Nikias Arndt is the man from Team Sunweb. And Fulsang was having real trouble getting his bike unhooked from that of Nikias Arndt. He... Is in pain. Oss across on the right. Oss have with the mechanical. One of the coffeeest riders as well. Gunneri was the rider from Group Armour FDJ, the lead out man for Arno Demar. The pace doesn't have to be on on these cobble sections. They do the work all by themselves to thin the field out. The break still out at over two minutes. Team Sumweb on the front of the peloton for Tom Dumoulin. It's toying the back. The race is falling apart. Toyings it is, who's on the front. Olivia Legac just hanging on at the rear of this group. They're already onto the next sector, and this is the first four-star sector. It's a big one. Only one kilometre between the sectors. That last one was the longest until now. 2.4 kilometres. Sars et Rossier, four-star sector. This is where I think some of the favourites for the stage will make their first big moves. This group still holding on to a lead of two minutes. Now Luke Rowe at the front, there's been a split. That crash has happened really near the front of the peloton and completely split it. Team Sky are all in front. So too is Peter Sagan, the green jersey. Gerrit Thomas is there. Van Avermaet is there as well. Now Chris Quintana Vroom. is here too. Vroom is there. And this 
is how much damage can be done. It is Gorka Izaguirre, the Spanish national champion. Well, you've just got to keep going until you get to someone with a wheel or your team car appears behind or like this. Look at the damage to that wheel. We can't even get it to fit through the frame anymore without rubbing. This is not the breakaway. This is the front part of the peloton after that crash. So that crash happened really far forward in about 25th position. It's Luke Rowe who's now on the front for Team Sky and he has got the throttle fully open. His parents rode to the race yesterday. They've been here on holiday and unfortunately his mum's bike got stolen at the finish yesterday after riding to the stage and Luke was not happy. Today he's taking out his anger on the pavé. And Egan Bernal is in this group trying to come back from that fall. There's Yates number 61 of the black colours of the Mitchelton Scott team. Alexander Kristoff is the rider in white. There's Mark Cavendish with the orange shoes on. Well Mark Cavendish was one of the riders on the ground in that fall. Got going quickly in this chasing group now but expect to see Team Sky keep pushing it all the way through to the finish and find themselves in an ideal situation. Not too many riders around, not too much stress going on to each sector and Kwiatkowski, he will just keep driving away at the front because they feel they're now safe and they're a long way to ticking this stage off successfully, although it can happen at any moment. Still 63 dramatic kilometres to go, but Team Sky, they're in the box seat. 10 sectors to go. 204 to the break, 24 seconds for that chasing group behind this yellow and green jersey peloton. Fanavamad is here, Sagan is here. Interesting to see that Gaviria has also survived until now. This is the Nibali group, they're not far behind, they're closing that gap. But Vincenzo doesn't have teammates. I think he's got Heinrich Hausler in that group. Plenty of riders there from Education First, Drapak. So they'll, he's got two teammates, but they're not at the front. There goes Yates. Make that three teammates now. Four teammates for Vincenzo Nibali. So they need to make the most of the tarmac sector. There's around about four kilometres for them to close the gap and another fall. Well, rider from Cofidis and from Quickstep. And is that Nicky Terpstra? I'm not sure. He's not in that front group. And it did look like it was him. He's not happy with the rider from Cofidis. We saw Terpstra look like he went over the handlebars. Don't know quite what's happened there. Off the cobbled section, even before the corner. And Terpstra, a former winner of Paris-Roubaix, was in the back of that chase group. He's taken out. And I doubt we'll see him coming back. Another rider we haven't spotted is Philippe Gilbert or Julian Alaphilippe. They were close to yellow, but at the moment it looks like they're being distanced. Just look at how many groups there are on the road now. Such a tough chase for those who have been caught behind. We have the breakaway group of nine. At two minutes, we've got a group that contains Chris Froome, Geraint Thomas, the yellow jersey, Greg Van Avermaet, is in that contingent as well. So too, from Movistar, they've got plenty of contenders. But this, a little bit further back, Jakob Fulsang. He's with Daryl Limp. He's got a lot of chasing to do. Movistar have got their leaders, Quintana and Lander, in the group with Chris Froome. Well, Fugel sung on the radio and screaming at his team. He wants to know where the teammates are. The good news for him is number 114, Raphael Micah, is there as well. And it looked like Bodnar had dropped back to support him. So they're desperately trying to scurry their way across. Here's the chase for Rigoberto Uran in the pink colours. This is the group with Gaviria, Bardet, yellow jersey, front group, Team Sky. It's under control for them. There's Bardet behind Peter Sagan, followed by Geraint Thomas, Valverde, Mikel Lander, Max Ricchesi, Chris Froome, Fernando Gaviria. And crisis averted for Rigoberto Uran. They now join that front group. And further behind, there's about another six groups along this stretch of road. This is the largest of them trying to chase back on. The next sector already there. Three stars, sector 10. This is for the breakaway group of nine. It's a 1,400-metre sector to Oshi. Ede at the back of the group. Well, fans of Paris-Roubaix, they'll recognise this sector. Peter Sagan was on the attack here already. 
in 2018. That group with Jakob Fulsang and Raphael Maika, 200 metres behind the Chris Froome group. It looks like they'll really join. This is not one of the critical sectors, Sector 10. Just three stars, fairly short, 1,400 metres. But after that, Sector 9, 2.7 kilometres long, a four-star sector. And now we're seeing a bit of a coming back together. There's plenty of riders here from Movistar doing the job to try and close things down. There's number 88, TJ Van Garderen. He's got Simon Gerrans working for him. And Van Garderen has been caught out. He's got a lot of ground to make up as well. That's bad news for BMC. It's been a tough day for them. They've already lost Richie Port. And now their next best climber, TJ Van Garderen, is left to chase. Room coming around the outside. There's Garrett Thomas with the white glasses and two teammates for Roman Bardet. He's got Gallopin with him and he's also got Oliver Nassim. Well, for Bardet, this is like a win to be in a group this small at the front of the race. A lot less stress to get onto the sectors. They're coming to sector 10. It's 1,400 metres long. After that sector, they've got seven kilometres until the start of sector nine. That is the sector of Bercy. 2.7 kilometres, four star. That's the one that everybody is, want to get, is going to want to be in the front for. And for TJ Van Garderen, he's got a minute and 15 seconds to try and make up. Well, Van Garderen was obviously caught up in that crash without going down. Rider being dropped from the front now. This is Jerome Cousin. So maybe the efforts of the first week getting to him, he's being dropped. The breakaway leaves Sector 10. Nine to go for the breakaway. Ede, he's just getting himself back in contact with the break. Kuzan, he'll be hoping they sit up a little bit and he can rejoin. Seven kilometres now to the next sector. And that is one of the toughest on this route. We've hardly seen the front of this group, particularly across the cobblestone sectors. They don't want to put the motorbike too close at the front because of the dust that it sprays in front of the riders. But the man in red, Thomas de Ghent, without question, has been doing a lot of the work. Well, he feels more comfortable if he can be on the front, see where he's going. Same goes for Team Sky. Chris Froome says to his team, just keep riding. It's a 60-kilometre team time trial. Let's just get there and get there safe. They're choosing the sides to ride in the dirt. It's a little bit more friendly on this sector to be able to do that. Although Chris Froome, safety first, he's staying in the middle. They have five riders in this group. It's Luke Rowe on the left, in the centre. Mikhail Kwiatkowski, Johnny Moscon's gone over the left-hand side of the screen as well. This is the Lotto NL Jumbo team. At the back, 162 is Robert Hessey. And they've got a problem off to the left, and that is Grossman. a problem for Stefan Kroosweig. Well, he was in that front group, so doing a fantastic job. The Dutchman, his two teammates, rode straight on past. It didn't see him till they were already past. They, They'll wait. They'll wait. They looked across the shoulder. They got the news quickly. They will be waiting. Warren Bagheel doing a good job. He's in the wheel of Peter Sagan. He may well be a climber, but he was attacking on the corresponding stage across the cobblestones in 2015. Nara Quintana just flicking to the left back onto the cobbles. Well, he's only just rejoined this group of Chris Froome and the rest of the Sky team, so wants to get himself to the front. 57, oldest man in the race, Franco Pellizzotti. He is in the front group, teammate of Vincenzo Nibali. They exit Sector 10 now. Arno Demar still here at the front, so he's got himself back on terms. A big group forming again at the front of the race. Seven kilometres to a critical section. And Jakob Fulsa. The team leader for Astana, along with Raphael Maika, have just rejoined at the back of this main peloton. TJ so Van Garderen will be hoping, hoping for a bit of a lull as well. He had a minute 15 to make up. This is Omar Freire at the back of the breakaway. He's back at his team car. And then there were seven. They are light green bottles today. 115 that you see drifting backwards. That is George Mulberger. Well, I wonder how many riders in this group watched the win of Matthew Heyman in Roubaix a couple of years ago and listened to his interviews where he says 
it's Roubaix, it's Pave, everything will happen to you. The one thing you need to always keep doing is just keep riding. Keep pushing because you'll get opportunities to come back where you never thought there was one. This is Molema at the back of the group. He's had a puncture, he's already back. Impressive with a couple of key teammates around him. Speaking of Heyman, it's Mitchelton Scott now at the front with Impey for Adam Yates. He was caught out before. And look who else is at the front right behind them in the pink. Awesome Lawson Craddock. That's Yves Lampard with a mechanical. Lampard with a mechanical prop, the Belgian national champion. Plenty of riders at the front from Education First Drap Pack. Simon Clark amongst them, Seth Van Mark, and they're protecting their team leader, which is Rigoberto Uran, second overall last year. And TJ Van Garderen, after having been brought back to the tail end of the group by Mickey Shah, is having all sorts of problems. There he is, number 88. For the Chinese, that's a lucky number. But not for TJ Van Garderen today. Well, he's back in that group with Mark Cavendish, but they're safely into the convoy. It's time to get yourself back in the peloton and up to the front of it. And I said it was Craddock, but it was actually Simon Clark, who, that's awesome in itself. He had a nasty crash yesterday with Dan Martin and Tony Martin. Simon Clark suffered a knock to the head and a bit of a neck injury, but got the OK and good to go from the team doctor. And he's playing his role for Rigoberto Uran. Now they spread out across the road. So they look to the next sector. The breakaway, 1.7 kilometres away from the next sector. Daryl Impey at the front on the right-hand side of the road with a train of riders from Mitchelton Scott behind him, protecting the rider in third position, Adam Yates. TJ, he's still stuck in the cars. He's got groups with him, and then he loses contact. This is looking like a real physical problem for TJ Van Garderen. Did you see that from the Quick Step team car? They offered a water bottle. I thought it was for TJ Van Garder, but behind him out of shot was Eve Lampard. Well, TJ Van Garder would do well to get onto Lampard's wheel. Catch a ride. But can he? Has he got the legs? He doesn't like these flat stretches at all. He looks to be really struggling with that high speed as now the accelerations come in the peloton. This is Daniela Bonatti, the experienced Italian for Movistar. There's just not enough room for everybody on these narrow roads in the north of France. TJ really struggling. He'll be looking forward to the mountains on Tuesday. He's back with this group. Tobias Ludwigsen is just in front of him. He's the big tall rider from Group Armour FDJ. And also in amongst that group, we saw the riders from the Lotto NL Jumbo team trying to support Stephen Kruzvay to return to the front of the race. Well, this next section they're coming to now, Sector 9, it's only short, but look at how many stars it gets. No, it's long. Oh, That's sorry, it's uh, they're 800, 800 metres go. from it. It's 2.7 kilometres, four star to Bercy. In fact, the one after Mons and Pevel, Pevel, one of the famous tough sectors from Paris Roubaix, but they only do about half of what they normally do in Roubaix. They turn onto it in a bit of a different spot. Going to be a difficult sector nonetheless. Van Garderen is now on the back of the peloton. Now he needs to try and move up. Struggling with the corners. He overshot that corner. It's as if he's a little rattled. The left hand turn and Chad Hager, the big American in white, leads them on. An update on the Dutchman, Stephen Kroosweig. He has rejoined the group of the yellow jersey, Greg Van Avermaet. This is the longest sector from today's stage of the 2018 Paris-Roubaix. Well, we've had sections of 2,000 metres and overtaken by 2.4, and this one the longest that they'll get today, 2.7 kilometres. Ede. He's been able to rejoin this breakaway, put himself onto the back, try and survive this very long sector. But if the last sector is any indication, he probably won't be with this group by the time to get to the end. And look at the flags. Not much movement at all. A very, very light breeze. Nothing more than that. And the lack of vehicles in front of them is a really good thing for the riders because the dust today would be absolutely choking if they had the normal amount of vehicles in front of the race. 
35, 36 kilometres per hour. Their day still holding at the back and the very smart Chad Hager in the white colours. He's not trying to race across here. He's just holding his own sitting in third position as Omar Fraley of Astana is going forward. He's off the front. Hager is just losing ground on those first couple as the peloton now. Got a couple more. One more bend in the road. In fact, they see the banner in front of them. They're about to enter the next sector to Bercy. Four stars, Sky lead the peloton. Again, they've done it onto all previous three sectors. Kwiatkowski, he leads them on, followed by Rowe, and now Van and has gone down. Sonny Colbrelli is the rider down for Bahrain Merida. So TJ Van Garderen, it is all falling apart. It is a really tough day out for Team BMC. Van Avermaet defending himself well. Richie Port out of the race with a broken collarbone. And TJ Van Garderen just can't seem to hold it on the road. Colbrelli, he's gone down heavily. I think that will count him out of this stage. An important teammate for Vincenzo Nibali. But Nibali, he is comfortable. He's been riding in the front of the race. And there he is. I can't imagine that anybody now from BMC will wait for TJ Van Garderen. They'll stick at the front with the yellow jersey, Greg Van Avermaet. I think Stefan Kung and Mickey Scher will have to go back. They've lost Richie Port. What they've got left for general classification is TJ Van Garderen. They need to try and get him back on terms. Kung and Scher are not going to win this stage. I don't think they're going to be the difference for Greg Van Avermaet's chances of winning this stage they've got to wait for Van Garderen. let's see if they do because at the moment they're riding towards the front with the yellow jersey at Greg Van Avermaet's still Luke Rowe on the front August of last year he had 25 fractures to his leg and the first doctor that assessed him said you may never race a bike again now he's at the front of the Tour de France. Thomas again through the inside on the gravel he makes it through and the riders taking advantage of those smoother little sections off to the left and right. So left have your wits about you. There's often real deep dips in those little pieces, potholes as well. Johnny Moscott now is the rider for Sky. He's at the front, followed then by Kwiatkowski. Garant Thomas in third position. They're not off the sector. It's a very small piece of asphalt in between. This is Maxim Bouet in the white colours. Starting to struggle understandable this has been a tough day Serge Poles I thought I saw there from Dimension Data Chad Hagen number 35 from Sunweb getting a little distance yeah starting to struggle looks smooth and in control but not seem to have the legs and Thomas now it's Greg Van Avermaet the yellow jersey he goes to the front Valgren behind him followed then by Jakob Fulsang who's only just rejoined that group oh I said it before this is the perfect sector for the potential winners of this stage to start throwing it down 50 kilometers to go and from Avermaet knows now he can start getting rid of some of the riders that will challenge him for the stage victory and what do they say the best form of defense is sometimes attack and that's what the yellow jersey is doing brilliant riding by Greg Van Avermaet but he's got no interest in the whereabouts of TJ Van Garderen because he's causing all sorts of problems at the front we well, see Van Avermaet through that corner avoids the gravel on the inside Follows the cobble, slowing, and that's the most difficult part to re-accelerate on the cobbles. TJ Van Garder, and he is in all sorts of trouble. With no teammates, they didn't wait. I've got him, Huncher. So it goes from bad to worse to even worse again for Van Garder. So for TJ Van Garder to say he's Tour de France, you lose a long lot of time today and look for a stage win at some point in the mountains. And Race Radio saying puncher for Roman Bardet. Well, there's so much going on. Punctures, crashes, the race splitting. Greg Van Avermaet is splitting things at the front. Here's Bardet getting a wheel change from a teammate. So that's the fourth stop already for Roman Bardet on this stage. As Greg Van Avermaet, he is trying to get rid of all the competitors. Jasper Stove and the Belgian for Trek Segafredo. He goes with him. And Jakob Fulsa, one of the favourites for the general classification in third spots. And behind, Team Sky sticking together. Thomas Kwiatkowski, Peter Sagan just looking on. Come from Gaviria. He was right behind Philippe Gilbert as well. We've already seen Greg Van Avermaet make an acceleration. And I'm sure that Philippe Gilbert is going to put out one of his own further. This is a problem puncher. for Jerome Cousin. 
He's in the breakaway group, and here is that split that's been caused by Team Sky and Greg Van Avermaet in particular. So for Bardet, he's got to catch the second main group on the road. Mickey Shah is actually waiting for TJ Van Garderen. Now Bardet makes contact with this group, but he's still got some work to do to get back in contact with the defending champion, Chris Froome. Well, there's another big group in front of that one, chasing this group led by Michal Kwiatkowski Quintana. from Team Sky. He's there, and he's just pats on the back. Another Colombian in the group, Fernando Gaviria. Not teammates, compatriots, happy to be towards the front. Well, the Colombians so famous for their climbing prowess. Quintana, he's doing it here on the cobbles, as is their sprinter, Gavidia. John Degenkolb in the white for Trek Segafredo. Here comes Heinrich Hausler. Who needs gloves? Not Heinrich. He's got Vincenzo for company, tucked in tightly. Well, with 45 kilometres to go, it seems the gloves are off for everyone, proverbially, because this stage, the peloton is just being blown to smithereens another fall this is sky chris Froome, and amongst it Froome. he's just stepped off he hit, hit a teammate gone over stepped over the handlebars he's okay untangles the bike to get going that was moscon who crashed in front of him Indeed it was, and Heinrich Hauser was the rider who was caught out for Bahrain Merida. Now at the front, it is Luke Durbridge by the looks of it for the Mitchelton Scott team. It is Durbridge. This is Froome who's behind Durbridge. Then Darrell Impey. Then Tom Dumoulin, number 32. Then it's Heinrich Hauser in the red colours. Sylvain Chavanel, number 183, and Adam Yates was the man on the back of that group. Greg Van Avermaet just escaping, going all the way around, half through the bush to get around that crash, staying in contact. Chris Froome just starting to straighten the brake lever back up, just getting going as soon as possible. Here's Yates in the wheel of Froome. The good news for Yates is Team Sky will all stop, drop back, make sure they get back in contention, with the exception, possibly, of Geraint Thomas. And it's also good news for Roman Bardet to be able to return. 58 seconds is now the gap between the main peloton and the remnants of this breakaway. And Roman Bardet is still at 500 metres to the group containing all the big favourites. Moscon fell, Froome went over the top and came down as well. Question is, what's happening right in the front of that first peloton? We saw Sky accelerate after the previous crashes. Is anyone else returning the favour? Froome is 200 metres behind this group as Philip Gilbert in blue goes to the front and Peter Sagan wants a piece of the action. My question is answered. I said Philip Gilbert is sitting there. He's waiting to make an attack. Now Sky are at sixes and sevens. Gilbert decides it's time to go because we've also got Bob Youngles here. And one rider we didn't see involved in the fall with Chris Froome was Naro Quintana of Movistar. So if Movistar can get themselves organised, there's a chance for them to make the most of it. Naro Quintana is definitely in this group. Julian Alaphilippe, we just saw a shot of him on his own, caught up behind that crash. Bob Jungels is there, I see him in his Luxembourg champion jersey. So Gilbert, more than an attack, this is riding for Jungels and to put Chris Froome under as much pressure as he possibly can. And at the same time, he's got Gavidia here, who makes an attack. There goes the winner of two stages in sprint finishes. In his first Tour de France, he's never ridden the cobblestones of Paris-Roubaix. He's now attacking. And Movistar, this is a chance for them to put Sky under some serious pressure. Vincenzo Nibali also moves himself back towards the front. He's got Jon Izaguirre, the Spanish climber there with him. That's Matthew Heyman looking back, see what's going on, wait for his teammates to come back up to him with Adam Yates. Gaviria, he goes on with it. The next sector starts in three kilometres for the breakaway. We're 49 seconds now ahead of Fernando Gaviria. The Colombian sprinter is on the attack on a cobbled stage. There's still a group of seven riders off the front. Gaviria has attacked the group containing the yellow jersey and the green jersey. 200 metres further back, a group containing Chris Froome and also Adam Yates. 
and then further back again another 400 or so meters is the big french hope roman bardet here is oliver nason the bodyguard doing the job for the frenchman well have they got anyone in this group who will contribute the astana rider behind he flicks the elbow doesn't want to know about it and morby star now go to the front because they have heard bardet is 500 meters behind Froome, and Froome is not yet back on or he's just got contact with the back of this group the riders from movistar that was the costa rican at the front andre amador it was then daniela bonati valverde lander and quintana this is the chase for the man in third position that is roman Bardet with Gallopin and nason in front of him this is the group with Froome and Adam Yates. Yates behind Froome, who's riding second wheel, and they're about to get back onto the front group led by movie star Alexander Kristoff here as well. Uh, Rigoberto Uran, the pink colours from Education First Rapac. Dan Martin is also there. Tom Dumoulin, he also rejoins in that group with Chris Froome. Adam Yates, he searches for the safety of Heyman's wheel. There's Moscon that going down. Froome straight over the top. Van Avermaet, he rides straight over Froome's bike through the bushes and goes on his way. Just a little bit of hedge trimming. Multitasking on a Sunday afternoon. A bike ride and some gardening. Also there for Wanted Group Goubert, that is Marco Minard. Kiesink also in this group. Well, that's it's not a very good parking inside. spot, but there was a rider on the other side of that car getting service. A bidon for the rider from Fortineo. Gruzdev now on the front for Astana. A key teammate for Jakob Fulsang, who sits in second position. Third is Iveti. Movistar, very happy with how the day is going so far for them. Just two kilometres to the start of Sector 6. That is the sector to Thibault on Enel 1,400 metre long sector, three stars. And the but riders they... have now got themselves to the front. They want that safety to continue. They're making their teammates ride to hold position. Here comes Bardet. He's third in line. Mark Cavendish in this group with the orange shoes on. Burkhardt also here in this group. Michael Hepburn is in the group as well. Look at the elbow at the front. And so there was Polianski from Bora Hansgrohe. Oliver Narsen and Tony Gallopin, the two riders doing the job for Roma Bardet. This is at the front of the race, and this is Reinhardt Yanti van Rensburg, who figures, let's see if we can go long range. Well, with a 40-second gap, he knows the catch is imminent. He's got to do something. It's Damien Godin, who says, I'm going to go with the South African. Speed up above 50 through that roundabout. Godin, he rails it, gets himself into the wheel of the man from Dimension Data. They're just 900 metres away from the next sector. Three stars, four, 1,400 metres long. Sector six. And with him, Damien Goudin is good in this race. He's been a top five finisher at Roubaix in the past. The South African, though, he's not worried. He is pinning the ears back, and he is committed to hit the cobblestones. They turn right. Fingers crossed they got through there safely. Peter Sagan just moving himself up on the left next to the Movistar riders. On the back of Team Astana on the front for Jakob Fulz. saying, well, Team Astana's Gruzdev and Fuglsang, who made an acceleration himself. The start of Sector 6, three stars, 1,400 metres. Look at the crowds. Then the chasing group, the remnants of the breakaway, they're on to the cobblestones. It's Omar Frale of Astana who's leading. Then to Getz. Here comes Luke Rowe once more in the white and black colours of Sky. And Gruzdev has got the bit between his teeth and he likes the taste. Well, I hope he also likes the taste of dust because there's plenty of that out there today. Gruzdev leads them on to Sector 6. Just 30 seconds now behind the break with 36 kilometres to go. Dust is the plat du jour this afternoon at the Tour de France. The anguished face of Roman Bardet. Baby faced at the start of this race. He looks like he's heading towards middle age by the end. Bardet signalled at 500 metres still behind that front group so not able to close the gap another crash another sky rider's gone down and rolled into the crowd Kwiatkowski 
the we just Polish national champion. How slippery it is on the stones in the dust. And he's on the outside of the corner. His front wheel just gets into that fine dust. Once you get off the apex of the stones, it just glides away from out underneath you. And they see the fall and they attack the attitude of Jakob Fulsang. It's dangerous. That's my territory. Jakob Fuglsang, he's a man who's won the Cape Epic mountain bike stage race in South Africa, and he's putting those skills on display now. Speaking of South Africa, behind him is Chris Froome, Kenyan-born, South African-raised, racing under a British licence, defending his title at the Tour de France. We also have a South African in front with Reinhard Janssen van Rensburg, along with Damien Gordan, and these corners are so treacherous. You dare to take the inside on the gravel, you want to make sure you're not going too quick. And like we saw with Kwiatkowski, you got on the outside of the apex, the outside of the crown of the cobbles, it slides away from underneath you. Dan Martin is still in that group. Now the gap is his car, right. Philip Gilbert and Peter Sagan. Now it gets... Hasn't reacted to anything yet. We've seen Gilbert just hovering around the front of him, waiting for an attack from Gilbert. And obviously, so has Peter Sagan. Gilbert misses the corner. And Sagan straight off it. Gilbert's puncher. got a puncher. Here come the classic specialists. It is Sagan followed by Van Avermaet and then Bosenhagen. Sagan misses the bidon. He gets that one straight on the chest. Laces out. Hey. Not of the head from Greg Van Avermaet defending yellow brilliantly today. Bade is 110 behind the front of the race. That's the latest update from Race Radio. Well, there was a big acceleration there from Greg Van Avermaet behind Chavanel. And here's where they are on the course. Our two breakaway riders, 38 seconds to the peloton. Gilbert at 56, but Bade, he is losing more time. He's 41 seconds back. It's going in the wrong direction. His greatest hope is to somehow close it down to Gilbert. Here he is. This is the group containing Roma Bardet. The bad news for Bardet is Tony Gallopin is no longer in this group. And it is just Oliver Narsen. Or oh, Gallopin's there, 25, but he's at the back and barely surviving. If there's any good news for Bardet, there's still a couple of kilometres from the next sector. It's only 500 metres long in a two-star sector. Then it's six kilometres to the next one. He's got some time to get organised with his teammates to try and get back. Thomas De Kent now, he's been pulled back. Also Ede. And Chad Hager and Lillian Kalmajan. So just two surviving. Reinhardt, Janzi van Rensburg and Damien Goudon and their gap is drifting out. A moment of calm in the peloton. A chance for Roman Bardet. It is exactly what Bardet needs. He's been hanging at 500 metres behind now for about 10 kilometres. Greg Van Avermaet, he's been doing plenty of attacking and chasing to defend his yellow jersey. On the other hand, apart from Richie Port crashing out and breaking his collarbone, and then the GC leader becoming TJ Van Garderen, he is nowhere in the picture. And in fact, by changing bikes, having no tracker, we can't even find out where he is on the course, but he's a long way behind. And Gilbert is back. That was Luke Durbridge, who he just patted on the back from Mitchelton Scott. And this is the chance for Bardet to close it down. All of a sudden, he's at just 350 metres. Rear wheel for number 63, Luke Durbridge. So possibly a slow leak there for Luke Durbridge, signaling he needs a wheel. Thomas again now at the back of this group, and he will maintain after this stage, I don't like the cobbles. Roman Bardet, he's not fond of them either at this point, but he'd be making up some ground now on that group. The break going further in front, they're out to 47 seconds. Bardet, I'm sure, has picked up 15 seconds on the peloton. He must have them in sight now. And as you just mentioned before, TJ Van Garner, with the bike changes that he's had, he no longer has a bike with a transponder on it. So we can't give you an exact update on where he is, but something that we can be very confident of is that he will be losing a huge chunk of time today. Upwards of five minutes. 28 seconds now for Bardet to the leading group, the yellow jersey group. The leading two riders, they're pushing their gap out. 45 seconds now. On the right of screen, the riders from Sunweb for Tom Dumoulin. Relative calm at the moment. A two-star section coming, crash in the middle. So people not paying... 
Movistar rider at the bottom of that. Mick Lander. This is Mick Lander who has gone down. Fourth overall last year. A big hope this year. Mick Lander is on the deck. Well, we just said relative, relative calm has returned to the peloton. He's drinking. He's hit a bump and gone down. Hand off, one hand off the handle over the bottle. The other one in the middle of the bars. And he's hit a drain in the road and just flicked himself off. Disaster has struck for Mick Lander. Movistar not waiting. Tom Scoyne's the King of the Mountains jersey at the front. So Movistar, before the race started, they said Quintana is clearly number one. They're not waiting for Mick Lander. BMC back to the front now, and the pace is on. Damiano Caruso at the front for BMC. I could hardly believe my eyes. I was thinking it looks like Caruso, but it can't be Caruso, can it? I thought Paddy Bevan, maybe. This is Damiano Caruso. The Italian climber, 11th overall last year. This is some way to defend the yellow jersey. Who is going with him? It's bad news for Roman Bardet, who was just 180 metres behind the tail end of that group, but now the speed goes through the roof. I think he'll close it as that group singles out on that middle section of the cobbles. It'll give them a real opportunity to close it up. Oh, missed corner for Caruso at the front. Greg Van Avon. And, and another ball. Tom Dumoulin. Dumoulin of Sunweb. Straight on the radio, I've fallen. Give me my bike, stay out of the way. He's nearly knocked off the Movistar rider. Big chase now in store. In fact, I'm not convinced that that is Tom Dumoulin. It looks like it might be Edward Toynes. 38, it's not Dumoulin, he's 32. Edward Turns, I'm convinced it is Edward Turns. Didn't have the five o'clock shadow. Is. Here it's is Tom 30. Dumoulin, the five o'clock shadow. Tom Dumoulin is at the front. No such problems for the Dutch leader. Well, a Sunweb right teammate, Turns crashes at the back. Dumoulin has the pressure on the front. Another fall, Ella Philippe perhaps. Well, we've been talking constantly about how slippery these roads are because they're dusty. He was doing nothing wrong. Also involved is Rigoberto Uran. The pink colours of Education First Rat Pack caught up in that. He was on the same line, the same speed as the riders in front of him, and his front tyre just let go. It is so treacherous when it's dusty. Mikel Lander is up and going again, but he's 500 metres behind the yellow jersey group. And he looked hurt. Shoulder ripped open. Could hardly prise himself out from underneath his bike. And no teammates for supports. Fernando Gaviria sitting on the wheel of Peter Sagan. We talk about the danger of the pave. All the crashes, just about all the crashes, are happening on normal roads. BMC at the fronts. This is Rigoberto Uran, who was caught up in the fall on the right-hand turn. Second overall in the race last year. Is that Michael Valgren again? It is Valgren of Astana. Teammates waiting. This is Anderson, the white jersey, along with Warren Bargill. One of the skinniest men in the race with some of the best bike handling skills. Wow, uh, is wow. Problem for Uran. Chain off. Set Van Mark is waiting with him. Meanwhile, at the front, Gordan and Van Rensburg keep pushing on 43 seconds they're maintaining that gap at the moment despite everything that's happening behind and the race is exploding just when we think it's going to be calm something else happens Bardet was at 130 meters before that attack at the front from Caruso he's now back out to more than 200 meters and we see Lander well he is almost 900 metres behind the main peloton. And Rigoberto Uran now, number 18, Sepp Van Mark. Full throttle from here, Sepp, supporting last year's second place finisher. He is three minutes behind Mikael Lander. Tom Scully is also there to do the job off to the left hand side of the screen. Oh, perfect teamwork for Uran here by Education First Drapak, surrounding him whenever it's needed. Look how small that front group is now. Bardet. After the crash has split it. 
Bardet is still fighting, trying to work his way back. This is the Mitchelton Scott group. This is for Yates. That's Durbridge. Heyman. It's then the South African champion, Impey, followed by Yates. Arnold yeah, DeMar. Cool. Arnold DeMar. There is Dan Martin, 91. Number 21 is Bardet. Lillian Kalmajan hanging in this group, one of the early attackers as well. And Domenico Pozzavivo from Bacre Merida, teammate of Vincenzo Nibali. In this front group as well, from Lotto and El Yumbo, doing his own thing, Stephen Kroosweig. Tom Scully and Sepp Van Mark. Sector four, three stars, 1,300 metres to Bourguel once they get off it. A paltry 200 metres of normal road before they swing on to sector three. Another three star. Put those together. That's a multiplier in anyone's book. Durbridge at the back in the back colours. They've just supported Yates to return. And it is Trek Segafredo at the front. John Degenkolb on that team, a former winner of this race, is doing the damage. Well, was that Degenkolb or Jasper Sturven going off the front? I thought it was John Degenkolb in third wheel. Scoins, further back, Scoins. Fernando Gaviria, mid it's, group. Sturvin, it's Jasper Sturvin at the front. I thought I saw Frodo. that smooth style, piston like from the Belgian former winner of Kuna, Brussel Kuna, and a real cobble specialist. This is a massive attack. He won a stage at the Tour of Spain with a broken hand. After the stage, the team doctor said, Sorry, you can't start tomorrow, but I just won. This is at the front of the race. How tough are you, Jasper? Tough. David Goudon, Reinhardt Yanti van Rensburg. Goudon, this is his moment. He's attacking the South African. Well, he knows they're coming from behind. 16 seconds left of the gap. Goudon, he has to give it everything he's got, and he's got to do it now. It doesn't matter so much if he offloads van Rensburg. He's just got to try and stay in front of a charging Jasper Stoven. He's not even halfway through what I'm calling a mega sector of this stage. Yves Lampart now on the front for quick step floors. Sagan in second wheel. He's looked controlled all stage. Hasn't put a hair out of place yet, Peter Sagan. They rattle across the cobblestones. The yellow jersey sits in fifth position. Degen Kolb is in third place behind Peter Sagan. End of the section, but not much time to regather your thoughts. But about to hit the next one, Geraint Thomas. He is cruising at the front of this front group. There goes Sturvin, just out of picture. So the chase of Eve Lampart stalls. 20 seconds still for Damien Godin. And they're getting ready to turn oh. on to the next sector. And here comes the chase from Movistar. This is Imanel Iverti at the front, trying to minimise the damage for Mikael Lander, who's in fourth spot. This is still about 35 or 40 seconds behind the front of the race. In fact, he's in third spot now, Mikael Lander, they're minus one. Cavendish off to the left. 40 seconds, 44 seconds behind the yellow jersey group. This is Warren Bagheel. Oh, he was calling for a water bottle from Lotto Sildal. And got fresh air. The computer said no. Bargill goes thirsty. Anderson out the front in the white jersey, the best young rider for Dumoulin, who sits behind him. Bardet to the left is moving forward. He's had his back to the wall all day, but he is up for the fight. Well, a bit more defending to do just yet, because here is sector three. Off the tarmac once again, and another three-star sector. The Bourguel to one hand, in fact, 1,100 metres. Another true Paris-Roubaix sector. The third last sector of cobblestones. Goudin out in front of the black colours. Yanti van Rensburg for Dimension Data. Sorkrau Anderson leading. Tom Dumoulin in second wheel. He now goes to the front and takes over. Tom Dumoulin is putting the pressure on this group now. And this group has been whittled right down. Chris Froome quite a long way back on the right of the picture. Riding in the dirt. Alexander Kristoff too. About 10th position. Peter Sagan does the same. Changes his mind. And Tom Dumoulin will be hearing about the fact that Chris Froome is drifting towards the back. And Geraint Thomas is not waiting for him. Well, Froome is here now at the back of the group, just through the corner now, Froome. 
500 metres to Mick Outlander. He's now in the earlier part of that sector. 15 seconds for Damien Gordin, the race leader at the moment, the yellow jersey group, Greg Van Avermaet, along with Peter Sagan, with Tom Dumoulin doing the riding on the front. Franco Pellizzotti, teammate of Nibali, number 57 in the red. This is the group of Rigoberto Uran, just a handful of seconds behind Miguel Lander. But importantly, he's got Taylor Finney, Tom Scully, and Seth Van Mark. At the front, Damien Goudon, in his shadow, Reinhardt Yancey van Rensburg. Well, really important for Rigoberto Uran to get onto that group of Lander led by Movie Star. Try and get a ride back across before he runs out of teammates. We've got a lot of work to do. There they are, just around the corner in the distance. And with the guys he's got with him, I think they're better ride back onto the back of this group and get themselves back in contention. Finished with sector three. Tom Dumoulin, a flick of the elbow to Peter Sagan. Jesper Sturven has made it across. There was two. Now there's three. And this has taken the pace out of that group. Three kilometres to the next section, which is a four-star section. Sector two. That is Confin on Pevel. That is a really tough section. Right hand corner, right in the middle of the sector. And at 18 kilometres to go, there's the sprint for the time bonuses. This is Sir Klau Anderson. Had a reputation as a junior in Dan Denmark for being a little too desperate in sprint finishes. Would throw the elbows around. The elbows have served him well on the cobblestones. Well, if it's a group fi finish at, uh, at the end of the stage, Geraint Thomas is the only man in striking distance to take yellow off Greg Van Avermaet. Will he bother getting out there for the bonus seconds? They've now mopped up the three. Gordin and Van Rensburg shake hands. Jasper Sturven is also caught. Soren Kral Andersen, a power of work for Tom Dumoulin. Oh. Nero Quintana sitting on the wheel of Peter Sagan. Just in fact, it's not. It's Alejandro Valverde. Quintana is in 10th wheel. A kilometre away from the time bonus. Fernando Gaviria is there. Valverde throws away a water bottle. Bob Youngles, the Luxembourg national champion, is in this group. So too is Chris Froome, Gerard Thomas. The chase is on for Lander. The chase is on for Uran. Team time trial was good for Education First Draft Pack. This is their second one. Got more reinforcements. Number 16, Pierre Roland has made it to this group. Rigoberto Uran is eating. He's not contributing to the pacemaking. And he doesn't look overly concerned. And perhaps expected worse on this stage. He's within sight of the Lander group. And in front now, another attack. Again, From it direct is energy. direct energy. Sylvain Chavanel in second position. Goudon has just been caught and is trying to launch Sylvain Chavanel. That's a, an attack lead out for Sylvain Chavanel. But Peter Sagan, he follows. Valverde in blue, Quintana in blue. Both at the front with the yellow jersey in the middle. Greg Van Avermaet. 1.3. Real with they attack that one and the final sector across M is extremely difficult. Dan Martin getting himself to the front of the group on the right hand side in the white. And so too is Adam Yates on the left, the second rider with the yellow helmet. Here's the bonus, three seconds for the first rider across the line. And Nato Quintana is trying to slip through. Valverde, in fact, it is. So too Dan Martin. But it is Greg Van Avermaet collecting it. One second for Dan Martin. Just a little throw at the line there for Dan Martin, trying to see if he could grab himself too. Got a lot of time to make up. The MC back to the front. Caruso for Greg Van Avermaet. Bit of reshuffling within this group. And everybody has been told the next sector, sector is ultra important. Movistar still chasing for Lander. Oviti, Amador. There's Lander with the jersey ripped open on the right shoulder. And Oliver Nason is in this group from AG to R Le Mondial. And Marcus Berker tells the cameraman can you please move forward? You're providing a slipstream for Iverti, who's just 200 metres off the tail end of the yellow jersey group. It's a long 200 metres, though. And also in that group, Mark Cavendish as well. Lander at 50 seconds behind the lead group. That group that we saw first, that was the group of Rigoberto Uran and Balka Molima. Now we've got 
the Mick Outlander group. As we look a little bit further up the road, they're almost in contact with a group containing all the big favourites that still survive. But the problem's going to be, with 17 kilometres to go, is the start of Sector 2. That tick up, reading 16.6. We haven't seen the lead group turn onto the sector yet. There it is. They are on it, in fact. And it's splitting apart. Yves Lampard on the attack. Greg Van Avermaet, the yellow jersey with him. John Deegan Kolb in third wheel. This is a bid for stage honours. Two Belgians and a German. Men who love the cobblestones. This is a sector that the specialists have earmarked. This is where they're going to blow the race apart. The early attacks is to soften them up get them ready for this where you cut loose so often on the cobblestones you see the jersey of the belgian national champion no matter who's wearing it well greg van avermaet he's using yves lampart for as long as he dares until he loses his momentum and then van avermaet he'll be prepared to go on with this and at the back there's no chase peter sagan's covered everything until now not anymore and the dust it's not the gorillas in the mist, it's the cyclists in the dust. Here's that right hand turn, 90 degree right hand up. Can't carry too much speed. Peter Saga now goes on the chase. Recognises the threats behind him. Quick step with Gilbert. Gaviria just about overshooting that corner. Roglic is in this group. Nibali is in the group. Dan Martin, Adam Yates. Sagan dragged them in quickly and right before he gets to the apex of the corner a little flick of the back wheel gets the angle on the bike carries that speed through others find that very difficult to follow Yves Lampard still on the front of this attack Van Avermaet in yellow in second wheel John Degenkolb two former winners of Paris-Roubaix in this attack Peter Sagan he is now forming a group behind the chase is splitting things apart another former winner and Geraint Thomas sits in third position and is that Quintana or Valverde that sits behind him with the Movistar That's colors on that looks Valverde. like Valverde in between Jasper Sturven, Trek Segafredo he's got John Deegan Kolb in front acceleration behind it must be Gilbert trying to go across the gap oh Nearly a crash coming out of that sector. The peloton, or what's left of it. That's Greipel for Lotto Sudal that exits. 15 kilometres to go. One more sector of Parve. As we look down, Bob Jungels goes through a little gap. And I'm sure that was the big figure of Andre Greipel turning off. That second last sector of Parve, Degen Kolb now to the front. Van Avermaet in second wheel, Yves Lampard. He was the man on the attack that really split things wide open. Van Avermaet seizing the opportunity now. Six kilometres until they hit the next cobblestone sector. And these guys, spring classic specialists, are riding this as if it's a one-day race. They're not worried about all the mountains to come. It's a rest day tomorrow. They can deal with the mountains when they reach the Alps on Tuesday. Sagan in green. Geraint Thomas is there, so too Fernando Gaviria. Roglic and Kruzvik. The M on the back of Nato Quintana also in that main group. It is definitely Greipel from Lotto Sudal who is in that group. Well, he will have some fire after being disqualified yesterday, second across the line. Thought he had the legs to win before he got tangled up. And we'll have a point to prove today. And on the cobbles of Roubaix, well, what a revenge that would be for the German. But at the moment, it's Lampard, Van Avermaet and Degenkolb on the charge. 14 kilometres to go. Another six kilometres to the final sector in M. After that, it's six and a half kilometres to the finish. And Rigoberto Uran is at almost two minutes behind the front of the race. This is Fernando Gaviria. But Rigoberto Uran is a kilometre behind the group that contains Geraint Thomas Chris Froome and Nato Quintana. Gaviria on the attack. He's got Yves Lampard up the road. Lampard attacked and split the group. I saw Gilbert go to the front. Now Gaviria has attacked. They've got a teammate in the front three. Although against these two, you'd have to almost call him a certain third place. But don't underestimate the Belgian champion. He is so strong. 
he also packs quite a sprint. Time trial champion of his country last year, road race champion this year, stage winner and momentary race leader at the Tour of Spain last year. Degen Cole, is he back to his best? 20 seconds, the gap. Degen Colby hasn't quite looked the same since that horrible training crash a couple of years ago. It's good to see him returning. Mikael Lander is losing ground. So too is Rigoberto Uran. And now that first peloton is splitting the chase. This Yellow is Yellow Van Endert who's also in the group. Peter Sagan, then Philip Gilbert says, I'm not chasing. I've got two teammates in front. And Quintana is the next man in line. Geraint Thomas, Alejandro Valverde also there. Steven Kroos, Primoz Roglic. This is the chase. This is Amador. Then it's Iverti trying to limit the damage now for Lander. Well, that's out to 53 seconds now for Landa and a further 27 back to Uran. So they're making no impact. The front of the race is going away from them. And at the start of the day, Mika Landa was seven seconds in front of Chris Froome. This the is day Bardet. He's conceding all that time. Bardet and Roglic behind him with Froome chasing. So it was, in fact, Kroosweik in front. Roglic, well, that's a good man for Bardet to have with him to try and limit some damage. Now this is the front, it is Roglic, he's, haven't seen him all day. Hiding away, we've seen Kroosweik a fair few times. Through number one, he has full respect for Roman Bardet. That's the first time we've seen Froome mark someone. Is that Marcel Kittel? Big figure from Katusha. Or Niels Pollitt. Looks too thin for Marcel Kittel. It's Niels Pollitt. 30 seconds now for our leading three. Indecision, people drinking back here. No chase coming, no GC riders up the road. The stage win is riding away from all of them. Greg Van Havermaet in the yellow jersey. What a display, Valverde now. Alejandro, we've heard about the drums for Fernando. It's now Valverde who is saying farewell to the peloton. <laughs> Sector, the last one, sector one, two kilometres up the road, 1,400 metres long, the sector of Hem. Traditionally in Paris-Roubaix, not one of the tough sectors, not much happens because it's had tarmac down both sides. That's been blocked off. You must take the cobbles. It is a really tough sector. Three stars, I think it's closer to four. So this is the group that contains Froome, Geraint Thomas, Quintana, Valverde has just gone forward, Jakob Fulsang is here, Vincenzo Nibali is in this group. Chasing at 40, 50 seconds behind is Lander, and then at a minute and 10 seconds down is Rigoberto Uran. This is Anderson in the white jersey now coming forward. Not worried about the white jersey, he's the best young rider. He's looking after Tom Dumoulin. This is the chase for Mikael Lander. It's Andre Amador now who's doing the job, followed by Iverti. Our leaders, Van Avermaet in yellow, Lampart, the Belgian national champion, and Degen Cole, former winner of Paris-Roubaix, likewise Milan San Remo, stages at the Giro, stages at the Vuelta, hunting one at the Tour. Well, for BMC, it's been largely a day of disaster, losing Richie Port early on the stage with a broken collarbone. TJ Van Garder and Mechanicals crashes. He's a long way out the back. But Greg Van Avermaet is putting on a demonstration. And Rigoberto Uran now is doing some of the chasing himself in the pink colours. He's done all those comparisons with Mick Jagger, separated at birth. Now he needs to move like him. Well, Rigoberto Uran, he realised he can't just sit on the back of his teammates and do nothing into the finish and have some gas left in the tank. He's got to give everything he's got to limit the damage because he is losing serious time to Froome, to Bardet. All those riders in the front of the favourites. Last sector, sector one, 1,400 metres, three star, but it's very tough because soon they'll see that the sides are blocked off by those little road barriers. You've got to stay on the cobbles. They are really rough with some massive dips as well. You've got to have your wits about you, pay attention. And when you can cut the apex, watch out for the big potholes. That is spoken by a man who rode this sector this morning. He took a very close look at this sector. 
and believe with some of the potholes on these corners we could see a few punches amongst the climbers think back about 15 years ago Johan Mousseau leading Paris Roubaix unassailable position hit one of those potholes puncture game over Magnus Backstead fought it out and won Paris Roubaix 48 seconds the advantage for the three riders off the fronts I can't see them being caught they won't be caught they're going further away and in fact I think they're going to win by up to a minute it doesn't make any difference to the men on GC. They'll be very happy with how things have gone, the ones that are in this group, and they're doing damage to Bardet and Uran. Philippe Gilbert now on the front, but just controlling the rest of the group. He knows he's got Lampart up the road, but he's going to need something special to beat the likes of Van Avermaet and Degenkolb. Greipel sends Van Endert to the front. Last-ditch attempt to try and bring back that threesome. And Gaveria is back in this group. He's the second rider in the blue. Here comes the chase. This is Mikael Landers' group. This is Van Endert doing the job for Andre Greipel, but it looks like it's too late. Now Rigoberto Uran. He's at 2.05 behind the front, which puts him at about 1.15 behind the group that he really needs to be in. End of the sector for our three leaders. Greg Van Avermaet in the Mayo Jaune. He leads them off the sector of him. John Degenkolb in the white in second wheel. Belgian champion Yves Lampard. He's going to have to think about what he's going to do to try and beat these two very rapid men at the finish. And I would think the fastest under normal circumstances is Degenkolb. But this has been a brutal stage. Van Endert setting the pace. Peter Sagan following. Andre Greipel in third. Gaviria in fifth behind Philippe Schilbert. But the time gap is not coming down enough to the front. 44 seconds under the impetus of Lotto Sudal. Van Enden gets through that corner safely. The green jersey, Peter Sagan, slips into his wheel. And Greg Van Avermaet is now holding a 57-second advantage in the overall classification ahead of Gerard Thomas. The front group now, that first chasing peloton, they are off the final sector. Six kilometres to go for our leaders. Six and a half kilometres. Another for the problem for Bardet. This is another mechanical problem for Roman Bardet. And he's got a helper on the side of the road, but he's got no teammates. Well, Bardet, he has just had a string of punctures and mechanicals today. We've seen him stop already about half a dozen times. This is a long change, too, for a front wheel. Way too long. Roman Bardet, he is going to be one of the big losers of today. This He's going to be caught by the Lander group. And that can be his saving grace. He gets going quickly once the wheel is in. He'll be hoping that Mikael Lander comes charging up alongside him. In the group with Mikael Lander was Oliver Narsen. So there can be some support there for Roman Bardet. No support from other team cars, no slipstream. Dan Martin now at the front of our chasing group behind the three leaders. So the Irishman, what a bounce back from such a heavy crash yesterday. He is tough. Indeed he is. Geraint Thomas is behind him, then Chris Froome, Chavanel, then Quintana followed by Valverde. All the contenders in this group, job done, just pay attention through to the finish line, no time lost, but there's some big contenders behind who quite possibly have lost their chance to win this Tour de France today. Our three leaders, but those losing time today, as we see Froome attacking, knowing that Bardet, Lander and Uran are losing ground. Well, if he wants to get rid of them, he just needs to keep going and get whatever teammates are left here to do the same. Being chased by Valverde and Quintana doesn't matter. If you want to distance Bardet and Uran and Lander, keep going. It's four and a half kilometres to go. So he's at 300, 400 metres behind the tail end of the peloton with Chris Froome. But behind him is Mikael Lander. And you can see the shake of the head, the disappointments. Lander will catch him. Well, they'll be coming right behind him now. And there they are, the Movistar-led group for Mikel Lander. So Roman Bardet, he will slot in here. And if Oliver Narsen is still in this group, he will also go to the front. The best thing Bardet can do is also ride with the Movistar team. He's got teammates. Narsen is there. He will have to work. Now Oliver Narsen will start to do the chasing. Bad luck didn't come in threes today for Roman Bardet. It came in sixes and sevens. Lampard our leaders. Lampard in front. Degenkolb. Then the yellow jersey of Van Avermaet. 
58 seconds, one of these three wins the stage. Look at the salt stains on the back of Eve Lampard. It's been hot, it's been hard, and it's been dusty. Well, I said earlier, Matt, the specialists, they're just waiting to soften the rest up, let the cobbles do their work, and on that really tough sector two, come fun on Pavel, that's where they're going to go. They've opened up the gap to former winners of Paris-Roubaix as Tom Dumoulin is on the attack, covered by fellow Dutchman Balka Morlema. Alejandro Valverde, he's going to shut that down. But Dumoulin, this is not attacking the rest of the group. This is knowing that others are out the back. Uran, Landa, Bardet taking advantage of the situation. Chris Froome, number one. It's been a successful day for Chris Froome. Likewise for number eight, Geraint Thomas. Troyer is there for UAE, number 98. They've done a great job for Dan Martin. Splitting again at the front, Van Endert. Here's Peter Sagan, he goes on with it. They are not going to get back to this leading three. And at what point do they start to fox and look at each other as Sagan? He's trying to make a move to get something out of this. Yes, the best I think he can hope for is more points for Green. It won't be for the stage win. Yes, Sturven chases, and then Gilbert with Bob Youngles. And Gilbert may well go on with it for Bob Youngles to gain a bit of time on the other climbers in this group. That's a really good gap they've opened up over the peloton. So Gilbert is going on with it. Bob Youngles, he's trying to steal a few seconds from the other main contenders. But back further, Bardet, or the French production, they are documenting every second of his agony. Bardet, mouth wide open, suffering to stay in the wheel. He's in the group of Landa with Movistar, trying to limit his losses. This is not Roman Bardet's territory. 20 seconds, though, is not a disaster. That's to the group with Chris Froome. 26 seconds at the moment for Bardet. Two kilometres to go for our leading three. Deegan Kolb in front, Trek Segafredo in the white jersey. Mayo Jean, Greg Van Avermaet defending that jersey with a big attack. But the man who instigated is in the Belgian champ jersey, Yves Lampard. He split the race apart on Canfon and Pevel, Peter Sagan with Jungels, Stoven and Gilbert are the chasing four. It's in Bob Jungels' interest to really drive this group because he's a rider who can finish inside the top 10 overall and there's a few seconds to be gained today. This is Bob Jungels, Jesper Sturven, then Gilbert, then Peter Sagan. Well, the rest of that group off there in the distance, who's doing the chasing behind realising that Jungels is up the road. I think I saw riders from Mitchelton Scott trying to increase the pace behind. But Gilbert, along with Jungels, they'll push this all the way to the line as the pace is dropping now in this group with 1.4 kilometres to go. Tactically, Robbie, what remains in front of them is a left-hand turn, then right, and right again. What do you do if you're the non-sprinter, Eve Lampard? Eve Lampard doesn't do any more turns on the front. He decides if he wants to take them on in the sprint or if he's going to make an attack. He's got to stay behind and let the other two do the work. He's got to gamble now. He's got 44 seconds up his sleeve. Don't go to the front anymore, Lampard. John Deegan Kolb, he'll know he's probably the fastest of this group. Keep it under control. Watch for the attack from Lampard. What was Degenkolb doing going to the front? Lampard smartly has now got the wheel of Greg Van Avermaet. Van Avermaet... Van Avermaet will back himself in a sprint. What we know about Greg Van Avermaet, he likes to go for a long sprint. Thinking Campere in front of Peter Sagan from 325 to go. But he's won a lot of races with a long-range sprint. And he'll believe he can take on John Deegan Kolb and beat him. This is not your normal sort of sprint. And Lampard, he's not slow, but is he confident enough to not go on the attack? He's the least explosive, so the longer they wait to start the sprint, the more difficult it will be for Eve Lampard. Deegan Kolb, he's not worried about time. None of them are. They just want the stage. Last corner, just inside 400 metres to go. Deegan Kolb. He's got his head on a swivel. And Here this, comes the chases. This is the chase for time. The green jersey of Peter Sagan through the last corner. It's Degen Kolb still leading. Van Avermaet playing the cold card. Likewise, Eve Lampart. Who goes first? It's Degen Kolb who leads out. He explodes. Desperate now to hold on. Has he got the strength? 
He's found Avermatt trying to challenge. Dagen Kolb, power into the line. Dagen Kolb, he wins. Jubilation for the big German. What a return for John Dagen Kolb. That horror training accident over a year ago. He's back. Peter Sagan will lead in the chases. Gilbert taking him on all the way to the line. Sagan takes more points for Green. And behind, Christoph taking on Greipel. It's Greipel. Bosenhagen. Greipel in there. Balcom Mollema delighted as he goes across the line. There goes Anderson. Valverde. Bardet just made contact with the back of the group. There's Oliver Narsen. So Bardet made contact. Incredible. Lander also just made contact. Here comes Rigoberto Uran. That's Taylor Finney who's on the front. Uran in second. Pierre Roland in third. Half minimization at this point. Well, Bardet, everything's fallen back into place for the Frenchman along with Lander, but he's going to have to assess the damage to that shoulder. But the loser of the day, Rigoberto Uran, he was doing everything right. When he did get behind, it all started to go wrong. Wasn't able to close down to that Movistar led group with Mikel Lander, and he is going to give away about a minute to the group of Froome and Bardet. This will hurt for Rigoberto Uran. Taylor Finney, he is empty in the tank. Rigoberto sitting just behind him. Not the day they'd hoped for. In fact, it's going to be more like a minute 20. It won't be, ha won't be a happy night for the second place finisher from last year. Well, some will love Roubaix after today, and some won't have such fond memories. It's the old velodrome of Roubaix, where Paris Roubaix, the spring classic finishes. This man has won it before, and now he's won the Tour de France stage over the pave of Roubaix. And what a return to the winner's circle for John Degen Kolb. We've often spoken about him not quite being the rider he was before that terrible accident where his team was hit by a vehicle training in Spain. He was caught on the front. Van Avermaet lined him up. Lampard realised he didn't have the speed. But John Degenkolb, he didn't give them a look in. He's put Van Avermaet at a couple of lengths. His last win at World Tour level was almost three years ago. He's won some smaller races in between, but this is the John Degenkolb we became so familiar with four or five years ago, winning regularly. Let's look at it from overhead. Low speed, he knows he's more explosive. Lumpart feigned to go, so Van Avermaet started too. That was the signal for John Degenkolb. Van Avermaet put himself straight in the wind, so never took a run in the slipstream. Put himself next to the back wheel, it was all over. Van Avermaet was going to win, he needed to start first, get going before John Degenkolb. But honestly, Degenkolb always had the upper hand. He's just faster, he's more of a sprinter type. There's our top 10. What a fantastic win for Degenkolb. I'm genuinely happy for him. It's a great story. Van Avermaet, what a defensive yellow. And across the cobblestones, Four Belgians or five Belgians inside the top ten. Five Belgians inside the top ten. No great surprises there. And a love affair with Roubaix continues for John Degenkolb. The bunch sprint was led home by Andre Greipel ahead of Edvald Bosenhagen. Then Timothy Dupont. Here's the general classification. Greg Van Avermaet continues to lead. In fact, extends his advantage in the overall standings. Then behind him, it's Garant Thomas at 43 seconds. Next best is Philip Gilbert at 44 seconds. We then have Bob Youngles at 50 seconds. Alejandro Valverde, Raphael Micah, Jakob Fulsan, Chris Froome, Adam Yates and Mikael Lander. Here's the sprint for fourth between Gilbert and Sagan. And I wonder if... Here's a look at the speeds. Sagan was close. 
it was quick when they jumped but from the front just winding it up well that's not right 42 k an hour i'd give him another 20 on top of that so the speed is definitely not right no. it's been getting slower as they've been sprinting put 20 kilometers 25 kilometers an hour on top of those so ignore the numbers you got it you got it what's going on in your, in your mind <sighs> pure happiness really i'm uh i was i was chasing this victory so long and uh, uh it's it's really hard to describe take us through the, those moments take us through those moments when you attacked when you're at the front with 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 the best guys out there it was it was a really hard fight the uh, whole day um uh, it was yeah also a, a victory of the team and uh we uh, we really uh, had a plan uh, to to stay out of the trouble all the time, and uh, that worked out really well. And uh, it was unbelievable. Um, uh, this is uh, a very big victory since a very long time, and uh, um, uh, I had been uh, through a lot of things in the past, and. Uh, it was such a hard time, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy to uh, to dedicate uh, this victory to uh, yeah one of my best friends. Uh, he he passed away uh, last winter, and uh, this was uh, this was really something for him because. Everybody said uh, I'm done. I'm after this accident. I will never come back. And uh, it's. Uh, I said no. I'm not done. I have to bring at least one big, one really big victory for for this guy. His name is Jörg, and uh, he was uh, my second father. And uh, it was a horrible accident, and uh, it's, it's a huge loss without him. And uh, I'm so happy to get this victory now for him. On the cobbles. On the cobbles. It would have been. Uh, there's no way to make it uh, more dramatic, more nice, more fantastic. Uh, I'm totally overwhelmed. Thank you very much. Congratulations.